Hello, everyone. I see my background is working excellently right now. Let's see if I can get that fixed before we do anything else. Or we can just. Wow. So yeah, it's not it's not buying the green street at all when it was working so well. All right. Well, is everyone hearing me at least? Are folks in the Zoom hearing me? Am I just talking to the void right now? You are audible. Okay. Well, so much for my special effects, but uh, welcome everyone. Oh, now the background works. Okay. May the land stand firm beneath us. May the sea gently surround us. May the sky stand tall above us. And the ancestors, nature spirits, and shining ones bless our work this day. And I'm just going to turn this background off because that's unnecessarily distracting. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our online sort of Ann Arbor Pagan Pride Day. Um, I look like don't want to act like I'm all depressed, but we're not face to face, even though I kind of am. But that's not a positive way to look at this. This is an opportunity for us to do something new for our community and for everyone on the internet, because we're not limited to Ann Arbor here. So uh, thank you for joining us. Um, while we're not an official uh, Ann Arbor, we're not an official Pagan Pride event. I will suggest that if I can get my screen share working. Oh, now we're getting all recursive. Uh, food gatherers is the food bank that local to Ann Arbor that we've worked with uh, for the entire run of our event. And I've worked with them through my ADF growth for over 20 years now. Um, obviously, I can't ask you to bring me a can of food uh, to my apartment as a donation, but uh, you can get information on their website here if you would like to donate to them. And uh, excuse me. And the link is in the uh, description of the video file of the YouTube video down there. So if you want to look there later. Um, okay, um, our first presenter is not here yet. So um, we do have Mother Multiverse here who may be able to come in with us for an additional workshop. Um, I'm going to give it a few more minutes to see if Saren actually gets here. Uh, how's everyone doing? Everyone say hi in the chat so I know that I'm not alone here. Hi, that's Shana. Hello. Good to know something's going out. I spent a lot of time last week trying to figure out how to make this work. And I thought I had the green screen working too, but there we go. Okay, it's one o'clock by my clock. Uh, Mother Multiverse, are you ready with a backup of some sort, a backup workshop for us to run with? Did our multiverse wander away from the camera? Well, this is an awesome start to our event, isn't it? I, I get a degree from computer, in computer science from the University of Michigan. I tell myself I'm not the kind of person who's going to have stuff like this happen to him on a, on a live stream. And yet here we are. No one is immune. No some of them in this. Um, all right, I'll amuse you with stories about myself for now. Uh, I've been the senior director of Shining Lakes Grove since 1999, the local EDF congregation. Um, I have been the only event coordinator for, um, 
for an Overpagan Pride since we got started back in 2016. Um, it is my privilege to take this opportunity in a time of crisis when we can't really be together safely, and I'm diabetic and have all kinds of issues that would make it very dangerous for me to be in a group. Oh, it looks like Sarah is here. We might actually be getting our proper workshop after all, which is good because it looks like Mother Multiverse just flat went away. And the best part is my internet connection has gone down three times this morning. So we'll see how any of this works. But I guess it's a pagan event, so you don't always expect it to uh, go that smoothly. So yeah, um, I was started practicing paganism in 1990. Eclectic Wiccan, like most of us, started out with in uh, in the early 90s. Um, but I, I it didn't quite call to me as much as its Druidry did. So when there was a local ADF group, and I finally went, it was like, yeah, this is this is more what I had in mind. So that's what I've been doing since 96. It is very odd to think that I've been involved in paganism for that long. Okay. You know, if I could edit the YouTube video later, I'd probably cut all of this out, but I don't think I have that ability. <clears throat> Maybe I'll get it to someone with better video editing skills than me and just have them uh, come up with some highlights we can share instead. Hey, I see someone in the waiting room. Hello, Sarah. Okay, sorry about that. Hello there, Sarah. All Hello. right. So I don't know, I've been trying to keep people of use for the four minutes since we got started. Sorry about that. Um, All right. <clears throat> okay. And I just hope your green screen works better than mine does. <laughs> well, hopefully. All right. So, um, folks, this is Sarah Odinson. <clears throat> he is doing the workshop on Polytheism 101. And if you're ready, I'll let you take over. All right. Welcome, folks. My name is Ez. Our wonderful host, Rob said, Sarenth Odinson. So what are we going to be talking about today? Well, this is Polytheism 101. This is going to be digging into the basics of what polytheism means, how it's lived, and exploring how we can use literary and archaeological resources as springboards and foundations to polytheist traditions. So we're going to explore what gods, ancestors, and spirits are, how we relate to them as polytheists, and how to engage them with respect. So... Just to keep everybody aware of where I am coming from, I am a heathen. I am specifically a Northern tradition heathen. I am Norse. So my expertise and my level of understanding comes out of that with polytheism primarily. So it's gonna be pretty, as broad as I can uh, cast this particular net. Uh, so if I get something wrong on your particular path, it's probably more of a, issue of translation than it is anything else. So let's get started. In reading and exploring this topic, I found part of the core problem of communicating between different pagan traditions and religions is in defining our terms. So to help with this, I first list the dictionary definition from the online Oxford uh, English Dictionary as a starting point for our discussion. We're going to then dig into the words, especially animism and polytheism. So what is polytheism? So polytheism is according to my source, <clears throat> the belief in or worship of more than one God. This is pretty straightforward. So each polytheist relates to the many gods in a number of ways. Some as son or daughter, some a servant, worshiper, a combination of these or something beyond the simple breakdown. But polytheism is, the, is straightforwardly the belief in or worship of more than one God. Monotheism is the doctrine or belief that there is only one God. Atheism is the disbelief or lack of belief in the existence of God or gods. Uh, agnosticism is a person who believes that nothing is known or can be known of the existence or nature of God or gods. 
Henotheism is adherence to one particular god out of several, especially by a family, tribe, or other group. This is a term that I came across during my religious studies core courses, and it came up again in a Hinduism course. It's a term rooted in polytheism. It recognizes many gods, but worships only one. Some bhakti worshippers from Hinduism are henotheists, and some pagans devoted to one god are henotheists. For instance, a Lokian might be a henotheist, and that they believe in many gods as beings unto themselves, but they only worship Loki. Next, we have pantheism, which is a doctrine that defines God with the universe or regards the universe as a manifestation of God. Then there's panentheism, the belief or doctrine that God is greater than the universe and includes and interpenetrates it. Then you have monism, a theory or doctrine that denies the existence of a distinction or a duality in a particular sphere, such as between matter and mind, or God and the world, the doctrine that there's only one supreme being. So monism started off as a philosophical term, and it's used in philosophy by Christian von Wolff, which said there is a unity to all things lacking a mind-body divide. Religiously speaking, the term monism has been used to mean that there's no divide between ourselves and the God or the gods. So a person who believes that we're all part of the body of God or we're all part of the goddess in that singular fashion is a monist. <laughs> Moving on, we have humanism, a rationalist outlook or system of thought attached prime, uh, attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Then you have the naturalistic, the philosophical the naturalism or naturalistic philosophy, which is the philosophical belief that everything arises from natural properties and causes, and supernatural or spiritual explanations are excluded or discounted. Then you have rationalism. That's the practice or principle of basing opinions and actions on reason and knowledge rather than on religious belief or emotional response. Another term that gets thrown around a lot in pagan discourse is archetype. Psychoanalysis in Jungian theory is a primitive mental image inherited from the earliest human ancestors, and it's supposed to be present in the collective unconscious. Archetypes, archetypes, excuse me, are supposed to be about mental unconscious forces rather than active conscious forces. So it's interesting that archetypes rose in prominence as a way of explaining the gods in, in paganism. It's, it's worth noting the definition, so at least we have a working understanding. Pagan, a religious, uh, a person holding religious beliefs other than those of the main world religions. Neo-pagan is a modern religious movement which seeks to incorporate beliefs or ritual practices from traditions outside the main world religions, especially those of pre-Christian Europe and North America. So that's our definitions starting off more or less in a nutshell, the other major definitions that we need to get to are animism. Animism is a theological position rather than a religion, just like polytheism is. A religion is the means by which a given culture, group of people, or a person understands reality. And it's a particular system of faith and worship. Animism generally accepts that all things are, are or are potentially and sold from the tiniest cells in the stars to the universe at large. There may be religions which understand different categories of spirits, such as the Buryat peoples understand the spirits in their religion as Tengar, being big or powerful spirits, Chatgor, which are spirits of disease, and other classifications and understanding of spirits, all of which have places and relationships with us, one another, and in all the worlds in a cosmology. So let's get down to brass tacks. Basic cosmology. The basic cosmology of an animist perspective is that spirits are in actuality or potentially in or of everything. It's distinct from monism in that God is a singular, isn't necessarily a part of this worldview, although it can be. How animism relates to polytheism is that animism lies in the very roots of polytheism. It nourishes it and helps to inform its theological position. I have no knowledge of a polytheist religion or culture without roots in animism. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one thing I'm gonna tackle that's very important, one of my students and dear friend has made and lives. The center of his religion is based in animism. Polytheism comes to it through there. 
As such, his primary relationship is with land Vatir, that is land spirits, Vatir spirits, and ancestors. His relationship with Scathi is second to that. So I want to make it even more abundantly clear here. I believe it's absolutely a valid thing to have the center of one's animist or polytheist religion placed with the spirits, the Vatir in my nomenclature, and or the ancestors. Not everyone can or should have to interact with the gods in manners like ours to have a fulfilling animist polytheist life or religion. I don't believe that every heathen needs to or perhaps should actively worship the gods, but to do, yes, have respect for them, an understanding of them, and to give them their due honor. Yes. So it's it's one of the balancing acts, really. So it, it depends on how you come through into the polytheist idea, worldview. So polytheism is the belief or, or worship of more than one God. It's a theological position that has animism in its roots and posit the spirits with the most power, influence, and cosmological significance and or relevance to oneself, communities, home, and habitat are worthy of worship. So defining features of polytheism. There are gods, ancestors, and spirits. These are the big three discrete categories of spiritual beings. And in heathenry, we have discrete categories for gods and lanvitir, not because of the size of the gods, but function cosmologically and relationally. So there's denizens of Asgard, like Hunan and Munin, Odin's ravens, or Odin's servant, Hermod. Now, Hermod can be seen as a god as well, so your mileage may vary on this one. So it's not that Hunan and Munin um, don't have significance, it's that they're not gods. So Odin is among a great, great many things, the god of wisdom and bound up in the cosmology and heathen worldview. Now, Hunan and Munin are bound up with Odin, and Odin is bound up with the worldview. So I'm actually going to kick on chat here to make sure I'm not missing any questions as we go along. Uh, I apologize for how dark this is. I know I was going to lighten this up a little bit before I got on here. I will do that for the next Zoom meeting. Uh, so moving on. Without the gods, there exists a cosmological gap. Like Polytheism is belief and worship of many gods. It doesn't exist without the gods being part of it. But that's not to say gods in Lanvatir, that land spirits themselves are discrete categories. Some gods are both, and some Lanvatir are both. And they exist as understanding as centers around which a given spirit can exist to one degree or another. So... Um, <clears throat> a god is a god because it has a place within the cosmology we relate to it and or we worship that god and they're a being with spheres of influence or of some significance so some gods which are now worshipped rather universally such as Brigid may have had their start in the past as goddesses of say wells gods such as Antinous and Imhotep were deified humans which is a process known as apotheosis so godhood is fluid and I've got no desire or hubris to impose definitions on the gods as such, but I want to give folks at least a, a running start on how to understand them. So with cosmologies, there's at least one, if not many creation stories with many gods, usually taking up different roles in forming the worlds, animals, plants, different categories of spirits, and so on. And generally speaking, in polytheist cosmologies, when I say cosmology, I mean like this is the how how the universe, as we understand it, works. This is how reality works. So you have sometimes multiple creation stories, and in, in every polytheist tradition, there is some kind of underlying force or organizing principle. But it usually tends to not be personified, or if it is, it's an impersonal god. So you've got an underlying force or organizing principle like fate, or Erther, or Weird, or Ma'at. Now, Ma'at in Egyptian comedic theology is actually sometimes viewed as a goddess. So this is where the, the, the firm definitions get wibbly-wobbly. And this is kind of a feature of polytheism, because as soon as you say something concretely, there might be a god or goddess that pops their head up and goes, ah, oh, excuse me, this doesn't quite work. So... 
Moving on, reciprocity is a key to living well with the underlying force principle or connecting energy, energy is the cosmos, and in relationship with the gods, ancestors, and spirits. This underlying force, fate, earther, weird, ma'at, what do you have? They are bound up in this underlying force or principle with us. We are not separate from this underlying force. The gods are not above or below or beneath or outside of this underlying force. Ma'at affects the Kemetic gods. Earther affects the, the Norse gods, the heathen gods. Fate affects the Greek gods. So it's the underlying principle that is recognized. And um, I can't think of any polytheist tradition that doesn't recognize an underlying principle of organization. Everything is bound up with it. Okay. So we're going to move on to hierarchies of being. I'm going to give you some really simple equations. And with the caveat, having talked about Antinous and Imhotep as deified humans, that some of these things get really wibbly wobbly really quick. So you have all gods are spirits, but not all spirits are gods. Some gods are a differentiated spirit category like land spirit, troll, Jotun, uh, uh, Titan. So all ancestors are spirits. Not all ancestors are gods. Some ancestors are gods and some ancestors are some differentiated spirit category. So you have some folks who relate to the land itself as an ancestor. Uh, for me as a heathen, I relate to fire itself as the eldest ancestor. So some ancestors are really big spirits and we may as well call them gods for purposes of cosmological function. So all spirits are spirits, not all spirits are gods, not all spirits are ancestors. Some spirits are gods, some spirits are ancestors and some spirits are in differentiated spiritual categories and sometimes they are blended. <laughs> so in some of the sources you get say, beings such as naiads and dryads, which are worshipped as gods or in some fashion become involved with a an established god such as Dionysus, and they become part of a Dionysian cult that involves these groups of naiads and dryads. And you also have in some of the lore where the naiads and dryads are the exclusive worship of a devotee. So with that basic idea out of the way in terms of the spiritual hierarchy and where we find ourselves, hierarchy is a kind of almost a goofy notion once you get around to the idea that some of these spirits are local gods and that hierarchy is relative to where you are in relationship with other things. <clears throat> So how is polytheism lived? Now that we've gotten all these crazy definitions out of the way, how do we actually live it? So we have reciprocity. Now we call that in heathen, we call that gebo or gift for gift, gift for gift. Uh, the Romans would call it du ut des. I give so that you may give. That's really what reciprocity boils down to is an relationship of gift giving where I extend the hand of a devotional relationship to a God. They extend their hand back to me in a relationship and the cycle of gift giving continues. And it can be something as simple as a cup of water. It can be as something as grand as a multi-layer offering where I've got herbs and water and whiskey and wine and all these other wonderful things. The long and the short of it is that reciprocity starts the relationship and keeps it alive. How polytheism is lived part two is hospitality. So we have this really weird notion in, in North America and in, in ca capitalism in general, where we own our property and we own the things that are on that property. This gets a little odd when you talk about things like altars. Do I own the altar? Legally, technically speaking, yes. But it's also a place that I set aside for my gods. So do I really own it? Well, in the sense that I am the host, yes. 
and that confers certain duties on me. And it also confers certain duties on anybody that comes into my altar space, um, whether human, divine, or otherwise. So hospitality is a huge thing in polytheism. There are as many stories as there are stars in the sky about gods that come to people's homes and judge them on whether or not they were a worthy host to them. So how do we keep this hospitality and this gabo thing, this reciprocity thing going? So we have what are called, I call devotional works. And these can be offerings such as food and water. Um, I mentioned earlier, wine and whiskey, uh, offerings of grain, fruit, the first harvest. Um, this can be art, music, writing, actions, such as making temple spaces in the first place, making altar spaces, activism, cleaning up a park or a beach. So a lot of things can be offerings. What I don't want to put out there is that one offering is equivalent to the other. A piece of poetry is not the same as a slice of bread. Especially if, as so many of us are doing right now, experimenting with things like sourdough uh, and making our own bread or brewing our own beer or what have you. Now, I'm not saying that a store-bought item is better or worse than a homemade item. Because if anybody has seen me try to make uh, any bread, it's... Uh, I tried to make brownies and they came out as a cookie sheet. So I, I, I'm not the best judge of uh, <laughs> baking here. So is it a good offering? Well, do the gods accept it? That's really like the, the marker of whether or not it's a good offering. Is it acceptable to the gods? So how do we determine what actually is a good offering? Well, we have literary and archeological resources that are, act as springboards and foundations to polytheist traditions. The thing about most polytheist religions as they are being reconstructed and revived today, excepting where you have continuity such as in the various Hindu religions and various indigenous religions that have existed, for instance, alongside Buddhism in Shinto and the Ainu people in Japan, you have reconstruction and revival based in literary and archeological resources. And these are, these are maps, not territories. We understand the principle of treating the lore as maps rather than territories because the the lore, as it's often referred to in heathenry, and the lore encompasses archaeology, written resources, records, all kinds of things like that. We have to understand these, these resources are limited in scope. They're limited to a certain time and place and a certain understanding. Uh, most of the writing that we have has some kind of bias and even breakdowns of archeological resources generally tend to have some kind of bias, usually towards the outdated model of the evolution of religion, which puts Christianity or agnosticism at its apex and animism as the, the primitive religion. It's bunk. We have had animism existing alongside monotheism for longer than monotheism has been around. Now, the sources that we have are problematic because a lot of them, at least for heathens, are secondary sources. We are spoiled for resources, and yet we aren't spoiled for resources when it comes to religions such as Hellenism, Magna Gratia, uh, the uh, Roman Reconstructionism, Remuva. Um, the problem is, is that we have a lot of what the elites did. For the sources that we have, we have a lot of what the elites left to us. We don't, generally speaking, have a very good window on what the everyday practice of the equivalent of a peasant was. So this is to say that our maps are limited and sometimes so limited because of focusing on one class that could afford to do all these things that were worthy of writing. Other sources of lore themselves, like secondhand accounts, are written with incredible bias towards the writers. A viewpoint like Adam of Bremen, translators of ancient writings, and so on. And the other thing to keep in mind is that new findings and analysis are being made year after year in the various fields concerning themselves with the written lore and archaeological finds and studies. So what's understood universally today may in fact tomorrow be discarded due to fraud, mistranslation, 
errors in understanding. So a lot of burial sites were believed to have held men in Viking graves. And I'm using quotes because Viking is not a nationality. It's a job. Uh, a lot of people that they were looking at in Viking graves had to be looked at again because it turns out they, their gender were identified incorrectly because the assumption was that if you were uh, buried with a spear, obviously you were a man. And they've gone back to a lot of various graves recently and had to completely reevaluate how these graves were categorized because they weren't male. So our information is because these are based in uh, the social and um, other hard sciences like archaeology, the breakdown of radiocarbon data, our well of knowledge is consistently improving and also being revised because some of the outdated models in archaeology and in um, philology are being updated as we understand different nuances of language and culture. So moving on, we have ways of relating to the gods. So I'm going to give four categories and there could be way more, but I'm trying to keep this brief because I've only got a half hour left. You have lay people, spiritual specialists, parent, child, and kin relations, lover, spouse. So what I really want to put out there is that you can relate to the gods in all of these ways to different gods. You know, I relate to heathenry as a, as a gothi, as a chieftain of a small kindred. Mimis Brunner Kindred, and I'm also a spirit worker. That is, I do a lot of intensive spirit work with various gods and spirits. The thing is, is that I am a lay person in other contexts. I'm not a Paco. So if I'm going to say uh, a fire ceremony, I'm the lay person. I am not the spiritual specialist. So the ways that we relate to our gods shifts depending on our relationships with those gods. And we do not relate to all gods the same way. Uh, I call myself Odinson because I have a father-son spiritual relationship with Odin. That doesn't mean that I have a father-son spiritual relationship with, say, Anubis. So you can have multiple contexts in multiple relationships, and even with the same god, depending on the context of, say, a ritual, you may or may not engage with that god or goddess um, as a spiritual specialist. It might be that when you're doing your regular devotionals, you're just doing devotional, not you're, you're not doing spirit work. Okay, moving on. How do we relate to our ancestors? The ways that I have relationship with our ancestors is blood, adoption, spirit, and lineage. So the ancestors in my understanding and in, I believe most polytheist understandings is that they are not only related by blood. You can gain ancestors through adoption, through various spiritual and divine relationships, and you can gain them through lineage, such as initiation into a mystery uh, specific cultus for God. Also, I probably should put a definition here about what cultus is. It is not being part of a cult in the sense of something negative or mind controlling. Cultus merely means that I am worshiping this God or this group of gods or these beings. Moving on, you can have of cultus of a God of ancestors and spirits. So how do we relate to spirits? We are cohabitant with them friends, helps. Uh, they help us. We help them. We, we can relate to them as helpers, guides, and teachers. And we can also regard uh, our relationship with certain spirits as lovers or spouses. This is not unknown in most polytheist traditions to have some kind of spiritual spousehood, whether it's with the gods or the spirits. The ways of relating to spirit most often encountered by us are cohabitants and sometimes friends, but definitely cohabitants, especially with regards to spirits of the land, the places we live. Uh, probably the best way for, for me to put it is 
we are <laughs> we're cohabiting with the land, but we are very often we are uh, unless we have a different relationship with our land spirits, we're we're guests. We are temporary. Where the the land is going to exist well after we're dead and buried. So this is all to say that we can have specific paths within polytheism regarding these relationships with the gods, ancestors, and spirits. Certain polytheist religions may have requirements of laity and spiritual specialists, and these can differ. A heathen will have different requirements from a comedic polytheist, and what's good as an offering to one god or goddess within a pantheon can be completely unacceptable to another. And there may be different soul parts, such as the soul matrix of heathenry, to that of comedicism. And this is just scratching the surface. So I invite everyone to explore all the subjects we've explored here deeper and to honor the gods, ancestors, and spirits and the journey wherever it takes you. And so I've gotten through the core of what I wanted to talk about. Now we can talk about um, question and answer session at this point, if folks are ready for that. Yes, ghosty, yes. Gavo and ghosty. Ghosty is a very big deal in ADF. You probably know that already. Absolutely. Our former Art actually wrote a book all about um, the nature of sacrifice and ghosty. Oh, excellent. I did not know that. Can you uh, link that in the live chat? I probably can. Hang on. Okay, well, if you folks don't start coming up with questions, I'm going to just start talking. <laughs> ah, excellent. So I see that Anna Repay and Pride has linked to the ADF's head. Oh, that's Kirk Thomas's uh, Sacred Gifts, Reciprocity in the Gods. Excellent. Former head, if we're going to be technical, but yes, he was our trade for six years. Yep, former shred, yep. Well, we don't have any questions yet. So what I can do, because I'm I am so used to doing this uh, particular show with a uh, live audience. Ah, excellent, Shan, thank you. What do you feel about the recent rise of Odinism all over the dang place? How do I feel about that? Oof. I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan at all. For context, for our, any listeners or viewers who might be seeing this uh, post-production, this is not Odinism in the sense of possibly like the UK. Oh, Odin's sons. Oh, I thought you was, I was reading Odinism. Oof. <laughs> Odin's sons. Okay, that's a different category altogether. What do I think about that? I, I think that Odin gets around. <laughs> uh, that's my kind of glib tongue-in-cheek answer. But truth be told, uh, I think that it's not necessarily a bad or a good thing. It just is. Uh, Tethra asks, what is a good way to protect your ancestor altar from outside influences? Yes. So when I set up my altar, part of the setup is to cleanse the space and to make the space conducive to the gods, ancestors, and Vaithya. The, doing that is a process of taking, for instance, in my case, a lit bowl of mugwort and taking that incense around the space and cleansing it and bringing that smoke as an offering to the gods and bringing that smoke as a cleansing space. Uh, so mugwort holds a couple of different places within heathenry as a cleanser and as an offering herb. So it kind of has this dual role. And between that and the fire, which is cleansing the space, 
it invites the gods into a clean space. And so there's the notion um, in heathenry and various other polyester traditions of you warding the space. So you might ask a god such as Thor to hallow the space before you do a working or to just keep the space holy. Um, I generally speaking will ask that of Mugwort um, and, very, and wh whoever the gods are that exist in that altar space. So Thor does ex exist on my altar. So <laughs> he's one of the gods that helps keep the space holy. Um, the way that I help keep the space holy is that I uh, will do my part to make sure the place is treated as a sacred place. So with regards to the ancestor altar, I do a very similar process where I'll take fire and mugwort smoke around the area, sometimes water, and then I'll just keep that place holy as a place of meeting between us and the ancestors. So... What was the hardest transition for you through different roles throughout your history of spiritual practices? Thank you, Nicole. You would pitch me the hard softball question. I appreciate that. Oof. Uh, what was the hardest transition? Gods. I think the hardest transition for me was going from a lay person into a spiritual specialist in heathenry. Um, because I really just wanted to come into, into polytheism in general to worship the gods. And from a very early point, I was not allowed to because <laughs> I had stuff to do. <laughs> um, I started off my journey as a pagan, uh, more or less as a priest of Anubis. Like the first, first year or two, I was, I was a lay pagan. I was just worshiping the gods and keeping the holy tides. And then all of a sudden got thrust into this position with Anubis. And that took me some time to work through for various reasons, notwithstanding my elders at the time. So the, that I would honestly say the, the transition between Kemeticism and, and heathenry was probably, if I had to pick up time, it's probably my hardest transition because I had to completely switch my headspace from a Kemetic Egyptian perspective to a Norse heathen one. Um, even taking recent developments with my former elder aside, that was a really hard thing because it completely upended my worldview. So uh, Shan Wolf is asking, what do I feel about the recent right of, of Odinism all over the dang place as opposed to Odin sins? Now Odin sins I'm cool with. Odinism can die in a fire. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how else to put that. Uh, o Odinism is racialist heathenry. I have never encountered Odinism in a context where it's not racial. So I'm sorry, heathenry is not supposed to be the white supremacist religion. It's just not. We are all children of Oscar and Embla, Ash and Elm. I feel incredibly strong about this. I probably could take up the entire space with my rant on racist white nationalist heathenry. I'm not gonna. Long story short, I think Odinism needs to go uh, be acknowledged for what it was, what it is, and no longer be relevant to the heathen or polytheist scene, uh, communities, etc. So Josie asks, suggestions for making sure your sources and information are not racist and or appropriate, especially regarding the rise of folks nonsense. This is hard. Okay, so specifically with regards to heathenry, this is this can be dicey because so many of our early sources are wrapped up in this nonsense. And it's not just in terms of the, the nascent heathen community. It's in terms of where, for instance, a lot of early rune work comes out of. It comes out of Ariosophy. So we have to recognize the sources for where our lore and our spiritual traditions come from. We have to really reckon with where some of the interpolation of white nationalism has come into our resources. So if somebody trots out Guido von Liszt, give that a huge hairy red flag side eye. Uh, unfortunately, because of recent statements 
made Edward Thorson, Galina Kraskova, Freya Aswin. Oof. Maybe once upon a time, people would have found these resources useful. Unfortunately, I can't recommend them anymore because of statements they've made in defense of and encouraging white nationalism. You know, uh, it's no secret that Kreska was my former elder. And while I would have heartily once upon a time recommended her books and resources on heathenry, I can't any longer. So checking your sources and information so that they're not racist or appropriative, that means doing your homework. That means finding resources where you can, where the stuff is as non-appropriative and non-racist as humanly possible. Unfortunately, because of the way that Henry has come to us down through the ages, some of that is going to be really hard. If not impossible, you're going to have to take some grains of salt with what resources we have. So that being said, the longship.net is an excellent resource and I highly recommend them. And Matthias Nordvig, Dr. Matthias Nordvig just released his Beginner's Guide to Heathenry. I highly, highly recommend that. That is shot to the top of my resource recommendations because it's not dogmatic. And yet it says, this is what heathenry is. Here you go. Explore this from here. Uh, I also heavily recommend folks get a good copy of the Edas, the Poetic and the Prose. Carolyn Larrington is my go-to because she's probably one of the best translators out there. Uh, Matthias recommended her book as one that he brings to his students. So that would be one of my recommendations is if you're looking for a good resource, get multiple translations. But if you need, if you only can afford one, I would definitely get Carolyn Larrington's. Uh, yes, theoi.com. Yes, that's a very good suggestion. I use theoi.com all the time in my own practice when I am praying to or worshiping gods of the Greek culture. So Kai says, what do you recommend for a first step for people transitioning from monotheism to polytheism? So that is going to depend on the monotheist tradition you are coming out of. Uh, there are some folks who need a clean break, no more talking with Yahweh, Christ, etc., or Muhammad, um, and the angels and all the others. There are some folks who are in a place where they can talk with God and make a clean break kind of uh, either as a dear John letter or as a sit down, Hey, I'm moving away from your worship. So my recommendation based on my own experience is that if you can take the time to intentionally sever your connections to, and by that, I mean, pray, Say, I want to be released from these oaths. I cannot hold these oaths in good conscience anymore. Uh, most Paul, most monotheist traditions have some kind of exclusivity creed or oath. And that's a big problem for me as a heathen because, well, if I'm oaths to only worship one God, then I'm an oath breaker unless I am released from that oath. So my recommendation is to sit down with God, if you can, and asked to be released from the oath. And I, I've never encountered a situation where he hasn't, but that would be my recommendation would be to sit down do some prayers. Um, if you feel like you need the support, if you feel like this is something you want your, your new gods in on, ask them to intervene and work things out on your behalf. The, approach you take is going to depend on how traumatic a background you have with monotheism. This is not easy, even for somebody who is at the point of agnosticism or not really knowing when they come to the end of their journey with monotheism. Our overculture is steeped in monotheist ideas. So the way that I would negotiate this territory is as gently as possible with yourself. So if you can, if you have the capacity to sit down and 
have a real good heart to heart first with yourself and then with God, then with your gods. I'm going to use Yahweh or Jehovah here instead of saying God, because that gets confusing for a polytheist. <laughs> God, which one? So that helped me a lot. Um, keep in mind, I came out of this as a very devout Catholic in my conversation with Yahweh Christ and the Holy Spirit was pretty amicable. Some folks are coming out of a deep amount of abuse with their Christian or monotheist background. And it's, it's understandable if you don't want to even like look back in the review mirror anymore. My way of doing things may not work for you. So I think this, I think to a certain degree, this does go along with the making sure that your sources and information aren't racist or problematic. Ooh, that is a really good point. Uh, folks have done a formal separation ritual from their old church. If you can do that, I would do that. I find incorporating ritual into the mix is incredibly healing. Not the least of which is that at least to my polytheist worldview, it's not like Jehovah or Yahweh isn't a god. You'll get this sometimes in pagan circles where, oh, we don't believe in that God. Well, there's room in polytheism for God and all his angels and the devil too. I, I don't see a point in denying the spiritual claims of Christianity because we're polytheists. It kind of runs contrary to our own view of the gods. Because if we have space for all these gods, including deified humans like Imhotep and Antinous, we're not actually threatened by monotheism's claims to spirituality or to the divinity of Christ. Uh, understanding this can actually help the transition out of monotheism into polytheism, because while monotheism is exclusive, polytheism doesn't need to be. Polytheism can draw the circles incredibly large. So when you're dealing with a situation where you're a convert from one of the main monotheist religions, the, the requirement for exclusivity isn't actually there. That's a feature of Christianity. And it might not be a feature that the actual gods of monotheist religions require. I don't know. I, I've i never worshipped Allah in the... And I, I know that there are certainly parallels between Christianity and Islam and Judaism because of the claim that Christians make that they are worshipping Jehovah and that likewise Allah is Jehovah I don't want to get into the monotheist well of things. I want to approach this from a polytheist perspective in that the exclusivity claims, we don't really need them. So the notion that there's anything keeping me in this box of I can't relate to or worship the Christian God doesn't really exist within polytheism because He's another God. He's just another God. So even that perspective might be quite healing for somebody who's coming out of a monotheist tradition into polytheism. I know for me, it has certainly helped. So I want to bring that round to... Um, Back to the idea of making sure your sources and information aren't racist or appropriative. The other thing we got to do is, is as much as humanly possible is decolonize our resources. And that means 
as much as we humanly can, taking it from our perspective as polytheists. Our perspective sands the Christian interpolation. This gets dicey when it comes to sources where the only mention of certain gods or goddesses we have come through the Venerable Bede, for instance, or through um, Adam of Bremen, or through, say, Snorri Strolison. Uh, I'm using heathen resources because they're the ones that I know the best. Excuse me. <clears throat> so as much as we can, getting the Christian and the atheist perspective out of our religions and disentangling them from the way we understand our gods, ourselves, our place in things is important, hugely important, especially because we have this unfortunate tendency within both modern polytheist discourse and in modern academic discourse of, well, this is a God of blah. And it puts a God unnecessarily in a box and <laughs> that doesn't really work when you get down to brass tacks. Like th people think of uh, Freyr as, you know, the God with the big penis and he's a fertility God and, and his functions wrapped up in that, in that role. Unfortunately, we have some, some decoupling and decolonizing to do from academic mindsets where you must fit into this box. Uh, <laughs> De Muzzle is a favorite punching bag of mine for this reason. I find him very frustrating. His perspective is that there are three roles in a given polytheist religion. You have your uh, classes of the leaders, the uh, warriors, priests, leaders, and the fertility gods. So the tripartite hypothesis posits that you have to have a, a leadership class of gods and that you have to have a warriorship class of gods and that you have to have a fertility ship class of gods. But the problem is, is that even with our gods of fertility, they don't just stick to one function. So polytheism is poly, many gods. Well, it's also... <laughs> doesn't imply that our gods must be only one thing. They can be a lot of things all at once. So I use the example of Freyr, who is a god of who is a god of fertility. Let's not mince, let's not beat around the bush, mince words anyway. But he's not just that. He's also the god that brings the good rains. He's also the god who fights. He gives up his sword for love and then he picks up the antler at some point later. He Almost every heathen god at some point or another has some kind of warrior aspect to them, even if it's not very highly emphasized in the lore. Uh, Odin is not just the god of wisdom or the god of the slain or, 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 or. And Freya is not just the goddess of sex and love. She's also a battle goddess. She is also a witch goddess. She is also, she is also, she is also. So there's this unfortunate trend within paganism to... Uh, box our gods into where the only definitions we hold with them are function related or cosmologically related when there's ample evidence, especially if you look at say Greek polytheism where different communities related to the same gods in different, fa in different fashions. Like take a, take a look at theoi.com's epithets for a while. And you've got, you know, uh, Dionysus, for instance, isn't just the wild drunken god. He's also god of these specific places and these specific things. He's not just the god of drunkenness and revelry. He's also the god of the wine press. And so brewing is part of this. And so he encompasses not just one aspect of it. He encompasses the entire wine brewing process, for instance. He doesn't just encompass drinking and wine, though. He has more and more and more. So it depends on who you're talking with and how you're interacting with that God or goddess and what mystery cults you may or may not be part of. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, our host made the point that Sparta had a temple to Athena at the same time they were at war with Athens. Yeah. So you can have contradictory relationships with the very gods that you're worshiping. And 
this is not a bug of polytheism. It's a feature. And I really appreciate you pointing that out, Rob, that Sparta had a, a temple to Athena. That That's fascinating stuff. And that, that totally is in line with polytheisms the world over. And not necessarily just in terms of um, conquering or combat or war. It would not have been unusual for people to bring home each other's gods. Yes, the Palladium, sacred defensive center of the city. Yeah. And so you've got all these different gods and goddesses and they relate to each other. So, and they may not relate to each other in the same contexts within the same city, let alone between cities, between city states. And when we take that inspiration from old, old uh, polytheism into our reconstructed polytheist religions, into our revived polytheist religions, your relationship with Odin, your relationship with Thor, your relationship with Zeus, your relationship with Athena, your relationship with Demeter or Vesta or whomever does not and probably will not look the same. Polytheism has within it, and I, I love this particular term from Dr. Butler, polycentricity. That is that there are multiple circles of truth and it depends on the relationships we hold with our gods and our cultures so that a heathen in texas may not worship odin or thor or whomever the same way that heathen here in michigan will and we may not even worship the same spirits because we have different lakes streams uh we don't have really many mountains here except for the porcupine mountains if you want to be real technical so we don't carry the same kinds of relationships between places. And I think one of the best features of polytheism is that it can and is often influenced by local cultists to local gods who then sometimes either intermarry or intermingle or become part of the big gods that might be part of our culture. And so that we can have these bleed over effects and we can have all this messiness and beauty and the messiness is part of the beauty. It's not separate from it. And it's an unfolding process between people and the gods, ancestors and Vatir, and between generations, because how I relate to that river may not be how you relate to that river, but we both can worship it as a goddess. And so we continue this cultus around this river between different generations of polytheists in good reciprocity, in good gable, in good gosti, in do ut des, I give so that you can give. And really, that is the functioning living core of polytheism, is that we live in relationship with the gods, ancestors, and spirits. And I include us humans as spirits. So it's not a separation. We're not a separate class. We're intermingled. We are co-creating. Fate, earther, Ma'at, we are all intermingled in the great web of creation. So I really appreciate the time that you've given me to talk here. And I appreciate your, your questions and your comments. And I hope you will have a wonderful rest of your day. Stay tuned for our next panelist. Please give them a warm reception. And uh, thank you. And I will see you all, I believe, at 3 o'clock. So thank you very much. Three o'clock is correct, and thank you for being here with us. Absolutely. Uh, is there any last questions? Get them in now. I mean, if we can have a few minutes until we start the next one. Absolutely. And uh, I will definitely be fixing my lighting in between. I didn't realize how damn dim this was. I was going to point out, but I think maybe you just like presenting yourself, but uh, you should have access to share your screen. So if there's anything, any documents on your computer you want us to look at, while they're talking, that will be an option for your next one. Oh, good. You got good, like good, a good. Word document or anything like that, you can stick it up there. Oh, can I repeat the sources I mentioned? Yes, thelongship.net, uh, The Beginner's Guide to Heathenry by Matthias Nordvig, uh, The Poetic and Prose Eta, translated by Caroline Larrington. I'm not sure if she's translated the prose of the poetic off the top of my head right now. Uh, but Carolyn Larrington, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N-E, 
L-A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N. That is who you'd be looking for. Oh, I also recommend Claude Lacouteau. And because it's French and I butcher the living crap out of the... How to spell Lacouteau. Uh, so Claude Lacouteau wrote a wonderful group of uh, books, which I, I find heavily useful to heathenry, including the tradition of household spirits, ancestral lore and practices. Uh, how to spell the name is C-L-A-U-D-E-L-E-C-O-U-T-E-U-X. Uh, the Tradition of Household Spirits is an excellent book. The Return of the Dead, Ghosts, Ancestors, and the Transparent Veil of the Pagan Mind, also excellent. I have not read the rest of Le Coteau's works but they come highly recommended in the circles that i travel in so uh, that being said these are the people that i recommend off the top of my my head and if folks want to ask more questions or want more information they can hit me up at s-a-r-e-n-t-h at gmail.com or they can look at my blog sarenth.wordpress.com or my patreon Sar uh, odinson it's patreon.com backslash s-a-r-e-n-t-h o-d-i-n-s-s-o-n so if folks and now that you've them, spelled all of those things out, I'll, I'll suggest that if you send them to me on the Discord later in chat, I can post them in the description of the video. Oh, and excellent. Just get them back here and look them up. Now that I've put you through the torture of having to spell them all out loud. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, man. Okay, well, does anybody okay, I think have we're any... Set. Yep, well, all right. Last chance, last chance to get something in for Sarah until later when he does his other workshop. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for being here. It was very informative. I, even I learned a few things. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I've been doing polytheism for about 25 years now. So. <laughs> thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, Mother Multiverse, are you ready? I'm here. Okay. All right. My audible. I am hearing you. Yes. I assume that this okay, is well. All right, so uh, hi everybody. Uh, today I am going over snake oil uh, building discernment. Uh, so starting off with some uh, background. Uh, my name is Mother Multiverse and I am a chaos magician. Uh, I've been doing magic for over 20 years and practicing chaos magic in specific for a little over 15. Um, I've also recently been working in this tradition called the Labradora. Uh, it's not very well known. It's a mystery tradition with some Greek roots. And uh, we've been kind of replacing most of the uh, visualizations used with like the sense of taste. There's a lot of kitchen witchery. Uh, and so we re revere um, Hecate in her aspect as this goddess of forbidden tastes. And so enjoying cultists together uh, we'll all go for a feast. Tide pods. Okay. Now, obviously, that's all nonsense. Um, at least, for, at least, much of that is nonsense. Hear me out. So, I am Mother Multiverse, and I am a chaos magician, and I have been doing magic over twenty years. But the Labradora thing, I like to start off with this for a reason. And the reason is because this is a discernment class. Now, as far as all that goes, I don't know who's out there. And I know some of you have more experience than others. And some of you have probably even heard me do this little spiel before. But um, the reason I do it is because you may not have raised an eyebrow at first. Like when I first said, oh, like Labradora sounds OK, Greek sounds OK. And then somewhere in there, suddenly you start to go, wait, something sounds wrong. The thing is, is we can all get misled and some of you depending on how new you are you may have gotten to the very end before you were like wait a second what's going on here so there's bad information out there and that's what snake oil is right it's the stuff that is false and in this class being a discernment class we want to be able to figure out what's false what's genuine what's somewhere in between and so i want to try and offer you all some resources to be able to do that now, the thing is, as pagans, uh, we're often working in the dark. A lot of our myths and materials are obscured in old languages and old books. 
and uh, sometimes personal experiences and sometimes questionable research. And we're all doing the best we can with what we've got. The word occult, which you'll hear they get bandied about a lot, the word occult is essentially clandestine, hidden, secret in Latin. And so in this world of secret knowledge, there's always potential to get lost. And sometimes that's harmless and sometimes that's dangerous. So, you know, why is this important? Now, obviously, getting misled in the occult can have severe consequences. Those can be social, those can be economic, they can be spiritual, they can be physical. And the information is, or misinformation you get, sometimes you get it by accident. It's just a you know, mistake. And sometimes it is, in fact, a malicious and deliberate kind of action. So for this class, uh, challenge is how do we identify bad information? How do we stop its threat and stop it, the spread of it? So I'm going to start and we're going to have three main kinds of snake oil we're going to go through. Purposeful deception, bad research, and mental illness. And we're going to start with purposeful deception. So purposeful deception, I break down a little bit too. Um, so the first kind of purposeful deception is simply the ones for profit. And this is where you're going to get somebody who puts together a book and they're not really caring so much about authenticity. They're caring about getting a book in your hand and getting money in their hand and trying to get that kind of um, thing going. And so they're either willing to fully or partially um, BS their way through these things and write down things that aren't necessarily authentic or useful to you. Um, and a lot of times it can be very insidious. It can be kind of done in stages. For instance, if you get uh, a book, you might read a book and you're like, okay, this seems pretty good, but it seems kind of incomplete. And then there's an ad in the back and it's like, oh, there's a, there's a video seminar. Okay. Like, so then you do the videos and now they're like on an email list and suddenly you're like, hey, if you really want to learn the real stuff, you got to come to one of my like live seminars. And then suddenly you're, you're like paying for this camp that's like thousands of dollars to spend one weekend to learn all this. And it's only after you like run into a friend who goes like, oh, what have they been teaching? Oh, they say they're like some sort of like, I don't know, for instance, I guess, um, Irish paganism. And they're like, yeah, I've been doing some Irish paganism stuff, and here's all the places where they're wrong based on the original sources, and now you're just out a ton of money. Um, so that is one way that can go. It can be very much in stages, just putting things out, because what is authentic isn't always very marketable. Uh, making things seem easy, making them seem glamorous and bigger than life, that's a great way to sell a book, but it isn't always true to life of how things work. Uh, one thing I would look out for in the case of these kind of deceptions is if the book claims to be from an oral or secret tradition of some type. Now that doesn't mean it's not true. There are oral traditions and secret traditions that are both, you know, totally genuine. But when you put that up as something in a book, you now get to deflect almost all of the criticism you could have had. If somebody's like, well, I read your book and it's talking about these Labradorans and Hecate is a goddess of forbidden tastes. And I haven't seen anything about that in the actual lore. And you could be like, well, you see, it's an oral tradition. So if you wanted to know that you'd only have ever heard it directly from somebody who's part of that tradition. So, you know, it's, it's secret. So you can't, you can't judge it. So that is, that is unfortunately an ugly deception of the tactic. I'm not saying it's always there. I'm just saying if you see it in the book, I would watch out for it. Uh, the second kind of purposeful deception is that for power. Um, now, this is the dangerous one because here we're getting into cults and brainwashing and brainwashing tactics. Um, when it comes to uh, cults, and brainwashing tactics. A lot of times this is the stuff that starts small and it builds up over time. Because let's say you go to a, a live pagan event of some type and you meet a group of relatively nice people. Maybe they dress really similar, maybe they don't. But you know, they come up and, and they're suddenly like, you don't know anybody and they're really friendly and you're like, that's really cool. 
And so they hang out with you a bunch and they make you feel really welcome. And that seems great. And that's that first kind of like a love bombing, get you in the door, get you kind of comfortable and feeling, you know, a good sort of way. And then it's going to be about getting you out of your normal comfort zone. A lot of times to like brain, brainwashing tactics, what people do is they unbalance you from your normal reality and then they start putting in their own le lessons while undermining your own sense of self. So for instance, they've been very nice. They hang out with you on the weekend. It's a little weird because it's not your normal place. So you're in a very different kind of mindset. And, you know, then they're like asking you to come out to events and things with them. They always seem to be doing something fun and they, and they ask you to tag along. And so you feel really good about it. And then somewhere along the way, um you kind of started to notice like man i am spending a lot of time with these people because they're always so super cool to me and they make me feel really special but then then it starts to kind of turn a little off you somewhere in there like for one you realize that a lot of the people that you used to spend time with aren't you're not spending time with because they kind of want you to hang out all the time and they're almost like in a way kind of almost going well i mean if you're not hanging out you're really not participating in the group and it comes forward a little less like you're being invited to something and more like you're obliged to. But, you know, you're going along with it because you still like them. They've been very nice and it's been very good. And uh, then it starts getting into the whole thing of they start that slow undermining thing. And this can work really well with magic groups because they might just start kind of talking shit. Uh, excuse me. Um, they may downplay the abilities and validity of a lot of other groups to promote their own so they come across as very elitist and the thing is you started to like them enough that you kind of believe them like okay like we're the best game in town and then you're starting to go well yeah because they're awesome they must be they must know what they're talking about and they're like but we can't really like involve you until you start really getting you know that next step you got to either initiate or you've got to you know start uh get buying into the system a little more and so it can go a long time and it might be everything seemed okay until around the next initiation they suddenly start asking for things that you're not willing to do maybe they maybe the head priest starts asking for sexual favors or you know, they start asking for uh, an ob obscene amount of money as an expectation. And the thing is, is they've been really replacing so much of your life that it gets harder and harder to say no because, well, you don't have outside resources. You don't have as much of an outside perspective. So everything that's happening starts to seem normal. And of course, this can be a source of misinformation because, you know, if this is seeming as somehow normal, and they've managed to use that power base to normalize themselves in the community. If they say something and that, whatever they say starts to proliferate, people just start to believe it because, hey, they're, they're important, they're there. Um, and we know that our community gets bad actors. We've had them, some get called out and some don't. Gonna be honest on that. Some get called out and some do not. Uh, on the level of um, why you need to kind of watch out for these sort of things, um, the vetting process in most pagan events is very low. Um, most of the vetting process for me is I've already done some classes here uh, and know the people running it. But it, in the case of a lot of other places, I just very quickly go, do you know how much vetting I got to do this? This much, this much, I did nothing to really get in the door beyond say, this is what I'm gonna do. So you've got this thing of these people can get into a place of seeming authority and a teaching authority kind of position and start spewing whatever they're doing for power or for profit. Um, and a lot of times victims won't speak out in that case because these people are in positions of power and it makes them not feel safe to do so. Um, so when it comes to these kind of things, uh, we have to be very careful. I'd say the, the other factor that keeps some of these bad actors uh, still able to operate in our communities is because, not just because people are, are scared of them like personally, 
but they're scared of the fallout because you know we're not we're not big we're not like the catholic church if one priest goes bad in the catholic church the church as a whole gets together and goes that's just a bad priest it's not an endemic problem it's not our problem they're just one bad one and they they shuffle them out of the way it happens with us there's bias in the media and i'm thinking there's a you know not entirely illegitimate concern that if something blows up it's going to blow back on everyone and maybe that's the case but i think it's starting to get to the point where we got to start really looking at things and going is it worth that blowback because otherwise those problems just continue to fester and instead of it being okay one bad actor in our community it's there's a bad actor in our community and we've let them to continue to act that way that's not okay the last out of the three in uh, pur purposeful deception. Uh, this is kind of the lesser, uh, lesser evil of the four power one. This is for belonging. And my little catchphrase for this one is, uh, I'm a Mary Sue and you can too. People know what a Mary Sue is. Like essentially it's, you know, a, a self-insert fanfic character that is in fact, you know, a bigger than life type of character uh that is that is supposed to be yourself and you're more main character than the main character and so you'll get some people who out of a sense of need for power or need for belonging or they just want to feel cool they will start bsing together like this identity and uh it's it's really problematic if they've got just a tiny bit of actual magical trading or skill because then it may be hard to suss out where the truth ends and the nonsense begins so you might meet somebody and this will happen more often when you're a teenager but we're gonna go over it because it could still happen there's still people doing this as adults you know so you happen across somebody but first they're just like i'm pretty good at shadow glamour and you're like oh yeah no they are i've seen them pop in and out of crowds and they just seem to kind of be real sneaky and that's kind of cool and then later they're like, well, I'm a vampire. And you're like, all right, like maybe I've heard about psychic vampires. Maybe I haven't. Sure, there's some kind of vampire. But then it's like, okay, like once again, that same slow route of tiny buy-in, bigger buy-in. And eventually you might catch it. But if you've been, if it's been normalized to it, you might actually listen to all of it and be like, this is just the way it is. Um and they can still create a pretty big group uh, almost through accident. The difference between them and the person with power that I think is, is sort of funny is like they're playing pretend, but they're willing to let you play pretend too. When they whip out and suddenly they're like, you got to realize I'm a vampire king. But, but, but it's okay because like I'm pretty sure you're, you're the werewolf queen. You know, like they'll try to bring you in rather than put themselves over you so it is it is a difference so it's it's still a problem because if, if these people are, are going around and they they operate a little under the radar some of the misinformation they put out there may take a lot of time for people to catch and go they're saying what about what now with werewolves and vampires and this and that's not how shadow glamour works in the first place like it, it can definitely lead to some misinformation flow um so that's that's pretty much it for purposeful deception now for our next type of snake oil that you'll get sold on this is bad research uh bad research happens and i'm gonna start off with the good enough method and sometimes this also feeds right into the for-profit model somebody writes a book and they start doing research and anybody who's done any kind of book writing or research knows that if you let yourself, you can keep writing and keep researching forever and eventually you have to put it out. So there, there's, a, there's a point where you gotta stop. But the problem is, is that some people, instead of doing all the research or doing the writing they need to, they're just like, well, I'm gonna take a shortcut. You know, you'll get people who do plug and play books where they're like, well, I just did a book about Norse Norse uh, Wicca, I'm going to go ahead and just take all those Norse gods out and start, I don't know, I'll plug in some Greek gods or something. And it's close enough. Their functions are really similar. The prayers should be really similar. It's good enough. It's going to think. And, you know, like, 
maybe if they were genuine about that process, it wouldn't be so bad. But often they make statements of this is how it's historically was. This is the truth of how this system worked, et cetera, et cetera. The embellishments are really what puts it into that category where now we have lies in the community because they tried to pull off what is essentially some shoddy modern shortcut writing and try to say that it is ancient and authentic stuff and that just creates a lot of misinformation um our second category for bad research comes down to spiritual truth now a lot of times somebody doing something like the good enough method might be like well you know i haven't read the book on it and you know but I'm pretty sure because of how I feel about it, this is what Apollo would have wanted. You know, that kind of thing where they're kind of leaning on their own sense of spirituality and think that's okay to substitute for historical research and then claim it's the same thing. Um, now, I want to I take a moment to talk about UPG. Uh, I don't know if Sarah covered it yet. <laughs> Sarah so covered a lot of things I'm going to cover in here, but um, UPG, unverified personal gnosis, the idea of a spiritual experience that you had and was not experienced by others or was not experienced in a way that you could prove it. So it's, it's unverified. And the thing is, UPG is good. Let me be honest. Most of us as pagans, one of the reasons we come to paganism versus some other religions is uh, we want uh, personal gnosis we want to have moments where we've really connected with spirits and gods and had ourselves involved with it rather than it be kind of trapped in a book and kept away from us right um and the thing is, is there's plenty of books that are full of upg that are very good books um the thing is though is that usually if it's a good book that's full of upg they tell you that it's unverified personal gnosis. These are, in fact, experiences written down by actual real life spiritual practitioners and the, the experiences they've had rather than try to be like, well, these are my spiritual experiences, but I think they're spiritual enough that I can say this is exactly what the ancient Celts did and not feel any guilt about just putting in your own opinion and your own experiences rather than being honest about what they are. Um, I'm gonna talk about two more things on the spiritual truth thing with UPG and stuff. Verified personal gnosis. Verified personal gnosis is like the better version of UPG that you can get because sometimes people who are separate uh, have very similar spiritual experiences without having had the kind of influence on one another where uh, where things necessarily would be influenced to match up, but they do somehow. And that's, that's kind of great because when that kind of thing happens, verified personal gnosis lets you, gives you a better experience because it's less likely to have been biased by your own mind, which now the last thing, sock puppeting. One of the problems with spiritual truth in a thing and why you need to be honest about it and say that it's going to be some sort of personal gnosis process is because when it comes right down to it, sometimes we listen to the voices in our head because they sound good. We don't always come across perfect and tuning into spirit, hearing what various entities want and having genuine experiences. Sometimes if we're not like grounding and cleansing and doing all the other things to get a real clear signal and we really want something, we may just hear our own voice and misinterpret that as a spirit or we'll make our own visions and misinterpret that as a spiritual landscape and it's not which is why it's important to label these things so that well that way people can navigate it and judge it on their own that's also important uh next thing on bad research second hand research so we've just identified two ways that uh research in a book or a presentation can get screwed up uh, it can it can be because somebody shortcutted, and it can be because somebody is trying to pass off uh, non genuine experiences genuine, or it could be any of the purposeful malicious stuff. Um, and then somebody writes a book, and they use those bad books as as resources. 
and that happens like trying to cut it off at the root is important because secondhand research is going to happen we don't have all the time in the world to like learn this stuff like i don't expect everyone to become like some sort of like spiritual scholar researcher and so it's okay to write to read a book that somebody else has written in the modern day trying to summarize stuff but the problem is is if their research comes out of bad research well then it becomes very difficult to sort out you know what's good and uh what's bad as far as a lot of that goes so that's that's obviously a problem but even if we were to eliminate a lot of these sources of bad information uh even if we were to control for all this and had really good research we didn't have malicious actors the last part of bad research is the one that's kind of unavoidable and uh did come up in Saren's talk earlier if you're still here from then uh new evidence comes to light like truth is, is a lot of our books and sources were written by old aristocratic uh europeans who had their own biases and ways of looking at the world and sometimes they wrote really crappy books and there was no one there to tell them no there was no one to vet them there was no one to make sure the research they were doing is good so if they start conflating gods like there's some real stretches on i really like like greco-roman myth so i'm just gonna equate any god i come to and just be like obviously this culture is just copying zeus or whatever that happens a lot so we've got these really bad books and sometimes they start getting called out you have historians finding better sources or older sources or reinterpreting the original source in a way that is more true to the culture it came out of uh you've got the case that sometimes uh an anthropologist uh you know or archaeologist i can't remember which is which correct but they come across something they didn't know before i can't remember which scandinavian country it is but they came across the uh, offerings underneath bridges uh piles of gold and stuff and it looks like they were there from when the bridges were built and so suddenly that's like a part of that spirituality it's a piece that we didn't have before of like hey like they made offerings before making bridges that's important and it could be that before when you looked at the religion that was not part of it you didn't think of that as being a part of your spirituality as far as it has managed to come together from all the paganism we've been able to research and cobble stuff together out of and so now you're gonna have to it's it's really the whole thing of can you be solid enough in yourself to realize i had some bad information that bad information is not me i'm going to cast that bad information aside and grab this new good information and you know if a practice turns out to be inauthentic you know you'll have to decide on a case-by-case -case basis how important it is to you to have that authenticity and if you do keep something that's inauthentic i think you at least need to be honest about it when talking to others being like yeah hey i uh i do this bs chakra system that has absolutely nothing to do with uh you know the greco-roman gods but uh and, and 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 the book i read it from said it did and i know that it's garbage like it's it's not good research but i like it and it works for me so i'm still using it so i'm just taking it as a modern practice now and not trying to pass it off as something it's not so that that pretty much covers most of our bad research stuff uh, the next section, I'm going to talk about mental illness. And so the first, so what I want to say is like, this, this is a subject that we have to come towards with a sense of, we need to be kind about it because in this case, what kind of can happen is, is in the pagan community, we will deal with a lot of um, essentially invisible forces, strange experiences, uh speaking to entities that others can't see uh and and doing things that may you know not seem ordinary to other people and there are other people who may see that and think they're on the same level or think that we're doing the same things but in some cases where one of us is you know talking to a spirit of god the other might be speaking to some kind of missing neurochemistry that they've got going on 
and I want to be very sensitive about this because it's not like I'm feeling as if um, it, it's a level of you feel for these people because they will get into our communities and unknowingly they could cause damage to themselves. They could cause damage to others. And so we have to like look at it with, you know, an eye towards being professional, being compassionate and doing our best to help them when we identify it and make sure everyone turns out okay. Uh, the first mental illness thing I wanna talk about is compulsive liars. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking of a specific subset of compulsive liars. Uh, I'm talking about the ones who have big fish stories. They come in and say things like, oh yeah, that one time I, I fist fought a bear. Uh, it, it, you know, it was really close, but I managed to like, you know, drive it off and I got clawed a little, but it's okay. Cause I regenerate like Wolverine. Um, and they'll, they'll have these really big fish stories and these beliefs, except they don't actually believe them, but they run with them. And I think there's a certain level of they, they feel like they're running around with people playing the same kind of pretend games. And so they want to have just some sense of community and kind of belong and they'll, they'll get into this mindset. The problem is, is that in order to kind of blend in and not get caught out, uh, they'll lie at the drop of a hat. So if somebody brings up a genuine question about, I don't know, Egyptian practice, they may BS something that sounds really good off the cuff, acting as if they know something when in fact they've never read the book about it, they know nothing about it, but they'll, they'll, they'll go for it. And so they can spread a lot of misinformation just by accident. Um, you get people who have genuine delusions um, or psychoses and you know they may see things that aren't there and interact with stuff that is that is a hallucination and that can be really tricky because well especially if they start to learn anything magical you just don't want that to like cross over in a bad way because if they start convincing people of well their hallucinations are genuine spiritual experiences or vice versa or suddenly you know they get involved in a ritual that they they really shouldn't be in that can be a problem that can lead to a lot of issues so that's one of those cases where and i'm sure that we have people in the pagan community who have controlled uh levels of this mental illness and take their meds and stuff and in that case obviously uh it's part of our you know, I think that's part of our job as a community to support them and make sure that they can get their meds and uh, help them as best uh, we can in that case. Um, the last one on mental illness I want to bring up is uh, want to talk about desperation. Uh, so this is the case where you, and this is a little different. This is kind of where you get somebody who wants to belong so bad and it's it's I've, I've brought it up several times the idea of people people in community and belonging and want to be cool and stuff like that but i think in this case it's somebody who's genuinely come in uh they're probably a newbie they want to start having these spiritual experiences and they want them so bad that they start to convince themselves that they're having them before they're actually having them and so in this case they may start so they, they start sock puppeting and uh, they start talking to themselves and kind of listening to their own voice and they may get in deep and they may start then, you know, obviously spreading misinformation that way by, by having uh, UPG that are not real. And so that's another thing. So that covers pretty much mental illness as far as I can uh, see it. So those are our types of snake oil, purposeful deception, bad research, mental illness. And so now we're going to get on to discernment as a skill. So, okay, as pagans, as people open to spirit, we have a tough job because we have to balance being open-minded with also being critical thinkers. Like the fact of the matter is, is that some of the stuff that gets said in the pagan community, you have to be a little bit open-minded to it to really think about it, cogitate on it get into it and accept this new information on the other hand we also have to be wary and have some skepticism to try and keep out you know the snake oil the bad ideas that are in fact you know deception or misinformation so to do that i've come up with a series of short phrases that i think 
are helpful little guidelines. So if anybody's like taking any kind of notes, like the, the previous section is good for, you know, kind of getting an idea of, okay, where can this misinformation come from? But if you want something just to personally help yourself, uh, I think these are good little phrases you can use to try and help you sort out information. All right, I'm gonna get started here. Phrase number one, if it sounds too good or bad to be true, it probably is. Sounds too good or bad to be true, it probably is. Um, this is this is pretty on the face, easy to go. If somebody comes along to you and they're like, you're cursed, you have a death curse, and unless you join my group, you will be dead in a week. They are full of crap and are probably trying to take advantage of you. On the same token, if somebody's really trying to, you know, like sell you on a seminar and they're like, no, no, like the spiritual practice, like you do this, you'll be able to do actual physical shape shifting. They're also full of crap. So if it sounds too good or too bad to be true, it probably is. It's a pretty good, I think, way to kind of sort a lot of nonsense. Uh, second phrase, learn some science. Uh, pseudoscience is one of the worst things we do in this community. Um, at least I think it's gotten a lot better in recent years, but I've had some arguments about electromagnetism being used to build the pyramids once long, long ago. And I remember telling them, like, if you were able to float a giant stone block using only electromagnetism, the amount of magnetism that would be used would send metals like sailing from across like you know the entire country towards that point like things would get destroyed and that did not go over well with the person in uh question learn some science uh because once you have an idea of what is physically possible most magic may bend physics a little but generally doesn't break it um and then also if somebody's doing something that's more of a hoax, like a, you know, magic trick that somebody's trying to pass off as a, as a genuine, like, spiritual act, you'll be better able to, to sort that out. And I mean, this, this is one of those things, too, of like, it's, it's useful because you can even help yourself from fooling yourself. I once did a psychic telekinesis experiment you make a little paper thing and you put it on a pin and you try to move it with your mind and i did this and suddenly it started moving as i waved my hand and i was like whoa but i hadn't put it in a jar which is apparently the better step you can take with it uh i, I just had a lot of static cling on my finger it was falling and i figured it out pretty quick but for a moment there i was like whoa so you need to learn some science because there's some pretty miraculous looking stuff that is just perfectly explainable phenomenon and you'll save yourself a lot of headache. Um, find several sources. Find several sources. Um, so good work tends to have references towards other good work. Um, so if you get a book and you like it and you look up its references, you'll have a better idea of where it got its ideas from um but it's good to look for several sources uh people who do a lot of the research are usually pretty good sources themselves to point you towards good books and those people sometimes if you're looking to their upg and stuff they can be very good sources themselves uh but by getting several sources it's helpful because let's say you have you know a book a book that the book references and you've got a person who suggested the book in the first place if these things start disagreeing with each other well that lets you know the places where there's disagreement and that lets you know where things are a little more shaky where your opinion might have to be formed a little more from thinking a little harder about it where if they agree on a lot of different things well the points where they agree you start to get a better idea of what's going on now mind you even even cutting the person out yeah having multiple sources where they agree more likely to be true where they all disagree also it's it's that's the places where you can really start to go okay this is where i gotta look a little closer and figure out what makes sense um it's just a helpful way to do it chew but don't swallow this is the next phrase chew but don't swallow so it is 
okay to think things over. You can try out a new idea without incorporating it into yourself. You don't have to immediately accept it as gospel truth. If you read a book and it seems a little off, it's okay to like just go, well, what if it is true? And try it out for a bit. And go, okay, does this make sense? Do these practices work for my life? Do they work in the first place? Is the source genuine, etc.? You can take time to think a thing over and try it out and then set it aside or spit it out if it doesn't work. And I, I say this because a lot of times one of the reasons why people will hold on to that information is because they think by being wrong, it somehow makes them a bad person and they would much rather hold on to a bad idea than, than feel wrong in any way. And I think it's useful to say, chew, but don't swallow. So you go, this information is not part of me. It is something separate from me. I can pick it up. I can put it down. I can chew on it. And if I think it's good for me, I can swallow. But if not, I can spit it out. Move on. Chew, but don't swallow. Uh, next phrase. Just because it works doesn't mean it's authentic. I'm a chaos magician. I have made... Uh, magic systems out of absolutely nothing. Uh, I could very easily take a fictional source, create a magic system around it, and I guarantee I can get it to start performing and start doing things. And that's fine, as long as I tell you that that's exactly what I did. On the other hand, uh, you know, say I was to make a magic system based on the Care Bears. Why not? Uh, you know, okay, tummy symbols, or symbolism. Yeah, we can work with this. Um, and that's fine. If I'm like, here's a made up system on Care Bear magic. If on the other hand, I'm like, you see, I found this golden tablet that had the Care Bears emblazoned on it. And in ancient times, it doesn't matter that it works. If the, if, if the backing isn't there, it isn't there. So just because something works doesn't mean it's authentic. And a lot of people who I would believe are just insecure or just looking to make money will try to pass off something that works but isn't authentic as being something it isn't. It's not okay. So just because it works doesn't mean it's authentic. Vice versa. Next phrase. Just because it's authentic doesn't mean it works. I have read some very silly things in some old manuals. Um, I think Pliny the Elder has some very nonsense stuff in their book. Some of it is probably pretty racist, too. Uh, Cornelius Agrippa, I think, several times references mythological animals that don't exist with a lot of just bad data. And these are old works. And I would say, in a way, they're very genuine because, well, they're, they're almost old enough they can't not be. It's a source from the time. And some stuff we, we don't have other authors to get from. But that doesn't mean it works. It may not work because it doesn't work for a modern context. It could be that we've learned some science or some other things that invalidate it. Or maybe it's just magic they wrote down that they got from some dubious source and it just sucks. I don't know. Just because it's authentic doesn't mean it works. Um, next phrase. Good people can have bad information. I think this is an important one. Good people can have bad information. I have met some very kind people, very sweet people, people who would take you into their home and feed you, and they pick up some wrong ideas, and they just keep running with them. Uh, I think the one that comes to mind immediately every time is the Easter Ishtar thing. Somebody out there for some reason thought that because Easter and Ishtar sound similar, that they have something to do with one another. And they don't. None of the research bears that out. And some people, often on Facebook or other social media, continue to share this as being a thing when they have been told repeatedly it is not. Um, and that happens. You'll get some very nice people with some very bad ideas that they just don't want to let go of. And uh, that's going to happen sometimes. Conversely, bad people can have good information. So getting back to the malicious practices, uh, the people working for profit or power, um, 
you can have people who learn a whole lot of legitimate spiritual practice and have a lot of good information and then use it in ways that it was never meant to be used completely not in the spirit of it or the ethics of it or just to be completely honest warp it in ways that are very useful for them to manipulate people the way they want so this is, this is one of those kind of watch out for it because like what i said like with the cults and things it might all look great first initiation all legit second legit initiation all legit and you get towards that third and now it's all something warped to their own twisted desires it can happen it's just the thing to watch out for uh next phrase zealotry equals insecurity um so you'll get people <coughs> excuse me you're gonna get people who will very insist on this is the right way this is the wrong way this is what i believe and if you believe anything else it is absolutely wrong very inflexible and a lot of times when people are like that and you know especially if they're kind of doing the my religion or version of paganism good all others evil outside of the sphere these are people who are really insecure and possibly also very manipulative and they are doing that and they can't actually back up their stuff i don't know Zeltry equal insecurity. It's one of those things I look out for when I'm trying to vet people who are spiritual practitioners. Because there is a short phrase that if I talk to somebody about spiritual practice and I hear this, this is when I know they know their stuff. When they are able to talk a good game, but all but willing to say, I don't know. Some people will have to have an answer for everything, and they do that because they need to constantly seem as if they're smarter than everyone. And it's, it, it can become very obvious. So I would say this is one of those little things watching out for, for somebody who seems like a manipulator. If they seem extremely zealous and there's no other way than theirs, it's insecurity, it's a red flag, don't deal with them. Uh, next phrase, not everyone will learn. Um, not everyone will learn. I've just already brought up the whole good people with bad information you can have a lot of good info you can have a lot of good practice you could you could take the time and share this whole presentation with them and some people just aren't interested like they might be a nice person they might be a not nice person but they're just not going to care about doing better or vetting sources or trying to make sure their research is good um, and the thing is, is it's not your job to be a crusader trying to save everyone. If somebody's, you can, you can offer good info, you can offer resources, but you can't make anyone take them. So it's just, it's just a sad truth. It's worth knowing ahead of time. Not everybody's going to learn. Um, this is the last one here. Be the resource you want to see in the world. Um, be the resource you want to see in the world by practicing good discretion, good research, by paying attention to make sure you're not spreading misinformation. Uh, it means that you're going to be more and more knowledgeable of how things work, how things are. And so when somebody asks you about something, you're not going to spread more misinformation, you'll spread more good information. So when you take classes like this, when you read books, when you do research, if you're doing it all right, you'll find yourself becoming more well-informed. And no matter how much you do, you're never going to know it all. But the good news is, is that we have each other. So if you see some information that doesn't seem right, take the time. Chew it over. Don't swallow. If it turns out to be false, maybe find figure out who told you it or, or what the source was. Maybe gently inform them that they may have been misled. And if you learn, if they learn, if they listen, which is great if they do, you not only improve their knowledge, but you curtail that misinformation from spreading elsewhere. It's like a herd immunity thing. If enough of us are well-informed enough, 
misinformation, bad information doesn't travel as far. If we're well informed enough, malicious actors are going to have a much harder time taking advantage of people. So it's one of those things though. It's, it's, it's definitely of personal and community benefit that we all try to learn how to keep out the snake oil and to basically promote the good information. Okay. So, uh, hope everybody, uh, had a good time. <laughs> now some of it gets a little heavy. Uh, I guess at this point I'll ask if there are any, uh, questions anybody has as far as, uh, the material or anything else. I mean, I could go for another like Tide Pod drum solo if people want to like see that. That is something I could do, but I don't think it's going to necessarily uh, be of a great deal of benefit for anyone. Well, I've got a drum audio file here I could play if that'll help. Oh, yeah. Do drum audio plus Tide Pod drum together. Get the ultimate uh, Labrador and rhythm going down. The best <laughs> of made up traditions. Uh, let's see here. How do you evaluate good divination versus bad or snake oil divination? That is a very difficult question to answer. Um, so in this case, I would say one of the things is, is that, okay, how do you, how do you do that? One, um, if you're going to somebody for a practice, um, make sure it's something legitimate or if it's not make sure they're very straightforward about that i use my own like homemade divination tiles but i'm pretty straightforward about i invented this this is what we're doing um i would say the other thing being is is if you can if you've got the, the either the money resources or friends or whatever to do it get multiple divinations because well if they're all saying the same thing, they're more likely to be true. And as far as a, a bad or like a snake oil divination, somebody who's just like out to make money, there's a couple things. And the thing is, is like, I hate saying like people who uh, are malicious actors, they're kind of smart. A lot of times they'll come into the community, they'll start plucking buzzwords and uh, anything that's popular, they'll start spewing it back. So it used to be like a lot of times they'll be like, oh, don't worry. It's just advice. There's nothing wrong. You want a really positive, fluffy kind of divination system. It'd be really easy to catch them out. Like, you don't care. But now I hear it from everybody, even people who are not very good at divination. They'll be like, well, you got to realize they're going to say what they say. And if it's bad, well, that's just how it is. So don't get mad at me. Um, like there's this very like, and they, it's like they know because they started to see the more genuine readers would say, hey, sometimes it's going to say stuff you don't want to hear, or sometimes it's going to be bad. And so they picked up on that. So it's it's not as easy to go with for that kind of thing. Um, so I would say really the best bet is learn some divination practice yourself. Because if you've learned some divination practice yourself, uh, you're you're more able to probably pick up on whether they're doing something that's a little off. Oh, and then also watch out for cold reading. Like, if they're trying to pull names from you and places and talk about your family, I hate saying, like, if you're really doing a divination, that's kind of not their business. <laughs> like, oh, I want to ask about something. I'd like it blind. Can you just draw cards? And then people who get a little more using that a bit more like a psychological tool, they're not going to do as well because they're going to want material to kind of run off of. So I'd say watch out for that too. We got any more? Uh, before you go, since Sarah's went ahead and plugged his uh, blog and Patreon page, not that I didn't want him to, but... I want to make sure you get the chance to do it as well. If you have anything you want to promote here. 
Oh, this is a good question too. Are there divination practices that are more susceptible to cold readings, ones that folks should give more grains of salt to? Yeah, I'd say there's definitely something to that because, um, I mean, I, I would say there's definitely something to that because the more interpretational a thing can be, the easier it might be for somebody to kind of BS what the information is. I would, you know, honestly, like that's a, that's a good question. Cause when I think about it, I'm like, it seems like I'd have an easier time if I was trying to mess with somebody, I'd use tarot cards because people see them on television. And if they've seen them on television, well, they know that they are magical and good. And so people are already a little bit in the headspace of, Ooh, I'm going to get the reading. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting and mysterious and whatever they say is probably going to be all magical and great. Um, but, you know, I would say I've, I've often had it where I will get a reading and they're immediately asking me questions about, oh, well, what is this about? Okay, well, who does it involve? Oh, I sense X. Is that, is that correct? And so they'll, they'll start trying to kind of calibrate to know who you are rather than try to let, I think, simple way to put it let the information flow into the medium rather than not. So I would say that as far as susceptibility goes, I'm going to say this, and this is like not a knock on them, but I am sure that for a lot of people, it'd be very easy to deceive them with the runes if they've never seen the runes. And if I were to cold read and I was really being tricky about it, I would have multiple divination set things. And I would be like, oh, well, what kind of divinations have you gotten before? And when they name the ones they have, I'll go for the system they haven't seen because now I can BS all day long. So yeah, that's probably my thing is I'd say like, watch, watch for bait and switchy stuff. There's some scary magical, uh, what's it called, mentalism type tricks that can do that where, well, it seems like they, they, they predicted something, but they actually didn't. They, they, they forced a choice on you and you didn't know it. People are making a lot of great cold reading jokes in here. <laughs> Sorry if I cut you off there, Rob. Yeah, I was doing it for your benefit. Just, is there anything you want to promote before we move on to the next workshop? Um, you know, if anybody wants to just, I don't know, look at uh, Mother Multiverse Media, uh, I'll probably be coming out with some game books and I'm writing a new magic book, but I ain't ready yet. Or if they want to get some very cheap, uh, you know, I am a magic and you can too kind of manuals. Uh, if you look up simple Psy man, E S I M A N on, uh, Amazon, there's a handful of, uh, very small, easy to do magic books that I have out, but no, otherwise that's it. Okay, well, that's something. That's something to promote yourself for. All right, thank you very much for being here. All right, thank you. Very informative. A lot of compliments from the chat, too, I see, so I can see why it's popular. I'll turn my video on so I don't look completely unpersonable here. Uh, Sarah, are you ready for your uh, 3 o'clock? Sure am. Okay. Um, again, I said, since we can't collect in person before you go, I'm going to... Bounce over, not for the food statistics, but here, food gatherers. This is the food pantry we work with locally when we have our face-to-face -face meetings that we collect food for them. Uh, obviously, you can't come over and bring canned food to my apartment right now, probably. Maybe a few of you know where I live. But uh, there are donation links here on the page. It's foodgatherers.org, uh, and that's, there's a link to it in the video description as well. Um, okay, I think the questions are all set for another multiverse. So, uh, if, are you ready to go? Yep. There. All, all right. right. And I will hand it over to you. All right, folks. Thank you for your patience. And let's get moving while I pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Okay. <clears throat> so. We're going to be talking about polytheism and the environment. 
This is a polytheist response to peak oil and climate change. Now, what I'm going to do for everybody's convenience is I'm going to share the screen. I need to adjust my key real quick here. Come back here. I got my notes on one device, I'm ready to go. Hang on, let's share this. Yeah, much better lighting this time, absolutely. I'm very, very much more pleased with this association. Let's go to share the screen. Boom. And I can't share the screen. Please allow me to share the screen. Okay, yes, yeah, may answer. Someone who knows Zoom better than me may have to remind me where I'm going to give you permission to share. The screen. It's under participants and under okay, more. I see it. Okay, not put in waiting room, presumably. No. Uh, what, what am I looking for here? I believe it's under. Uh, you click that more button, and it should allow yeah, me I to. Well, I see chat, stop video, spotlight video, make host. Maybe I'll make you the host. I mean, that'll do it. I'll have that, a cord, put a key room. That'll do it. Which one? Put make host? Mm-hmm. All right. Okay. You and are I'll, go. Okay. And it's still streaming, no problem. And it should be recording to your desktop as previous. So uh, actually, is the record button on for you? Uh, well, I'm not. I'm not recording it. I'm having YouTube okay. record it. So. Okay. Good. 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 As long good. as it's still going on YouTube, we're we're good. Yeah, we're solid. Okay, so I can now share the screen. God's help you all. Okay. There is my little tablet. Thank you. Oh, my tablet. Oh, hello, tablet. Okay. Now I'm going to share the screen and up. Now. Where is the slideshow button? There it is. And play. Here we go. So welcome. This is a politist response to peak oil and climate change. Anybody who's been paying attention whatsoever to the recent developments in the west of our nation, this is going to be pretty on the nose for a lot of folks. I understand if some of this is going to be challenging or even dramatic to watch. So if you need to step away, I totally understand because this is a lot to take in. Uh, there is a lot to talk about, so I'm going to get right to it. And if you have questions, uh, hit me up during the chat, and I will answer them at the end as best I can. <laughs> okay. So first off, uh, this is going to explore the predicaments of peak oil and climate change, what they are, how we can respond to them from the polytheist worldview. Now, to begin with, I'm going to lay out the ideas we'll be talking on, framing the ideas of peak oil, climate change, and potential responses from a polytheist perspective. So... Just a little bit. There we go. <clears throat> so after that, we're going to open up the floor for discussion. So what is this? We're talking about problems, predicaments, peak oil, climate change, permaculture, sustainability, polytheism, animism, right relationship, and reciprocity. Uh, we're going to quickly define these. We're going to move through this quick because I don't want to spend too much time, especially because I think most of our uh, watchers have seen the polytheism 101, and I don't want to repeat myself too darn much. A problem is a matter of situation regarded as unwelcome or harmful, needing to be dealt with and overcome. A predicament is a difficult, unpleasant, or embarrassing situation. I use the Oxford English Dictionary for most of these. Heads up, it's at lexico.com. Definition of peak oil from peakoil.com. Peak oil is the point at which the demand for peak for oil outstrips the ability of the market to supply it. It is not running out of oil. It is the inability to meet supply demands. It is not, I will repeat, not, 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 not running out of oil. Now, peak oil theory states that any finite resource will have a beginning, middle, and an end of production. At some point, it will meet the maximum level of output on your screens is what peak oil looks like. It is a bell curve. All resources go through this. Long story short, it is a matter of when and where that particular bell curve goes. Estimates for total recoverable oil on our planet is about 2 trillion barrels of oil. On a cumulative basis, we've pumped out one. 
We are halfway through the whole stock of the planet's oil resources, according to Financial Planning Magazine of October 05. 64 out of 98 oil producing nations, including the US and Saudi Arabia, have hit peak. That's according to lastoilshock.com. From the Wall Street Journal, April 26, 2017, the oil shortage feared by 2020 as discoveries fall to record low. The IEA, International Energy Agency, says the US shale won't fill the void, which could lead to petroleum shortages. And there is an excellent visualization, which I won't click on. I assume that we can put these in the chat at some point and or link them in the accompanying video. While we are producing oil, more and more of it has come from non-conventional sources like shale rock fracked wells offshore oil sites. We've never produced as much of our own oil as we did in 1970, but every increase in the ability to extract more out of the ground. They require higher investments of capital and resources to access. And given these methods of oil extraction are more energy intensive and exploratory than conventional oil drilling methods, it means we're burning more oil, long story short, to find less oil. <laughs> They're vastly more environmentally devastating because the methods used to extract them. Tight shale oil and fracking is grinding up heated rocks and sand and putting water through it so the oil can be extracted. Fracking involves punching horizontal wells in hard rock and then detonating explosives or pushing high pressure water and chemicals into tight rock to encourage oil to flow. At this point, peak oil is a predicament. There's no solution to it. I will repeat that. There's no solution to it. Predicaments don't have solutions. This is because of how much oil is being used versus being extracted. Whether you reckon we hit global peak back in 05 or 2015 or that's down the road, it really, it's, a, it's an academic debate. It doesn't matter when this happens. It's going to happen sooner or later. Peak oil would be far less of an issue if our entire economy weren't predicated on cheap abundance for fuel and manufacture of goods. While there's plastic alternatives being developed, like plastics made from corn, avocado pits, and the like, there's no ability for any other fuel to scale or to do the things that oil does for us. This graphic is an International Energy Association analysis on restod data. It's conventional crude resources discovered and sanctioned year by year. You can notice the long-term trend has been a slight peak in 06 and then in 2010, which is probably where our fracking boom came in. And then a precipitous drop in 2011, and we have been on a downward decline ever since. Now, approved resources versus discovered resources. All of these are going trending down. This is not good for our continued development, for our econo economic growth, any of it. The growth in world oil supply demand, this is from PricewaterhouseCoopers. These are not fringe sites. This is PricewaterhouseCoopers. This is an investment portfolio, folks. And the source for this is the IEA oil market report of December 2017. This is re recent data collated by experts. This is not some fringe website saying, oh, it's going to blow up tomorrow. No, this is happening in real time. Companies are making future stock and purchase options of physical and stock resources based on this information now. The long decline in uh, new oil and gas discoveries, uh, again, precipitous drop, water price, Waterhouse Coopers, same resource as previous. This is the Restod Energy Strategy and Research. Now we get to climate change. Climate change is a long-term change to the average weather patterns that have come together to define Earth's local, regional, and global climates. These changes have a broad range of observed effects that are synonymous with the term. These are changes observed in Earth's climate since the early 20th century, primarily driven by human activities, particularly fossil fuel burning, which increases heat trapping greenhouse gas levels in Earth's atmosphere, raising Earth's average surface temperature. In other words, the big blanket that keeps us from being a frozen ball is also the one that helps keep these, feed these feedback loops going the more carbon we burn. Climate change refers to significant changes in global temperature, precipitation, wind patterns, and other measures of climate that occur over several decades or longer. That's from UC Davis. The previous explanation was from climate.nasa.gov. This is the current definition of climate change. The atmospheric carbon dioxide has never been above this line. This is from climate.nasa.gov. The 1950s level is very currently pointed out. We are approaching 440 parts per million carbon dioxide levels. And as you can see, we are on a complete upward trajectory for CO2 parts per million. Problems are a matter of situation regarded as a welcome or harmful and need to be dealt with or overcome, as I said earlier. A predicament is a difficult, unpleasant, or embarrassing situation. It is a situation we're encountering, not a problem, it's predicament. 
permaculture, which is one of the solutions we'll be talking about. Well, not a solution, an addressing of the problem. The development of agricultural ecosystems intended to be sustainable and self-sufficient. Permaculture is a design discipline based on set of ethics and the foundational principles of the natural world. Permaculturalists apply what they learn from nature and traditional land-based cultures to the human environment, developing ways to ecologically produce food, create shelter, store water, design economic and governance systems, and meet human needs via informed ecological design to develop human communities that improve the environment of life so all may flourish. That's from permaculture.org. The UCLA Sustainability Community yeah, Committee says that the integration of environmental health, social equity, and economic vitality to create thriving, healthy, diverse, and resilient communities for this generation and generations to come. The practice of sustainability recognizes how these issues are interconnected and requires a systems approach and an acknowledgement of complexity. In simplest terms, sustainability is about our children, grandchildren, and the world we're going to leave them. Now, polytheism is the belief in or worship of more than one God. Animism is the attribution of a living soul to plants, inanimate objects, and natural phenomena, the belief in a supernatural power that organizes and animates the material universe. Right relationship to engage with the gods, ancestors, and Vatir spirits, and reciprocity and fulfillment of duties to with them in our communities. So reciprocity has two definitions that I like to work with. There's the old English dictionary definition of the practice of exchanging things with others for mutual benefit, especially privileges granted by one country or organization. That's one way of looking at it. And then there's gift for gift, gift for a gift, and do it des, I give so that you may give. The acts that make and continue good relationships within policy, polytheist worldviews, that's my definition. So a polytheist perspective on environment. Cosmology is prime. How and what does cosmology do for us? Well, we talked about in polytheism 101, cosmology is how we relate to the world around us, where's our place, and it's a living worldview. We exist in co-creation with gods, ancestors, and spirits. The latter includes us. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on polytheism because, uh, well, <laughs> there's polytheism 101. If you haven't seen it yet, it will be up on YouTube. So the air we breathe and things that allow our cars to run, as well as the cars themselves, are potentially, if not actually, in sold. We have gods and goddesses of air, earth, water, fire, ice, so on and so forth. Oil itself is made up of dead plants and animals compressed into an energy-dense and toxic substance. How we treat these dead matters a great deal. When you stop relating to oil as merely a resource and you relate to it as the dead in your gas tank, it takes on a different feel. This is fundamentally different from some nebulous punishment um, regarding climate change and the predicament of peak oil and climate change. It's not a punishment. It's a consequence. I need to repeat that. This is not a punishment. Gaia is not spanking her children. Gaia is merely allowing the biosphere to respond to how we've treated it. Or maybe instead of allow, Gaia is just responding. Or, or Yorth. The earth goddess of the heathens is just responding. However you wish to frame it. The long story short is that the environmental crisis we're entering into and peak oil are predicaments precisely because we've let a problem go unsolved for too long. So what's a polytheist perspective of peak oil? Again, the air we breathe and things allow our cars to run are potentially if not actually in soul. I think I've already said this before. Uh, the peak oil is not running out of gas. It's not running out of crude. It's the point at which the energy return on energy invested becomes so low, it's not worth investing time and energy to get it out of the ground. Oil used to be about 100 to 1 in terms of energy per barrel of oil. Now it's 30 to 1 today. If I got 100 bucks for every buck I spent, that's a huge return on investment. And 30 to 1 is also a huge return. The problem is that between the systems we fed up, we've fed we set up, it's not like a 30 to 1 dollar amount. Because that 30 to $1 amount encapsulates also the energy you have to get that $1. That 30 bucks is being continuously spent. So it's not a proper ratio. It's more like an amortization on a mortgage where the required input goes up, not down every year. The problem of peak oil is that we have set up physically and monetarily. We can't get much lower and be able to operate these systems, much less thrive. Uh, the challenges of peak oil, we got a lot of them because it's directly addressed with how we live our lives. So how do we work to live with less? Less energy stuff and stimulation, which was coin yeah, coined by Archduke Emeritus, uh, John Michael Greer. How do we encourage our communities and ourselves to live better with the earth? 
How do we orient our communities to living gently on the earth? And how do we organize and engage with our systems of power generation, food, water, and so on, so that we have enough for our needs while being regenerative to the environment? How do we create and or maintain our communities as we face peak oil and climate change head on? This means not burying our heads in the sand. This means how do we look at these situations and go, okay, let's do this. So we're gonna talk about climate change and then we're gonna talk about how we address these things. Climate change is unfolding of earth or, or weird fate. This is long story short, reiterating the consequences understanding, not punishment. Rather than framing this as the environment or the gods, ancestors or spirits punishing us, this is addressing an imbalance. Our desires for things are out of step with the world to provide and we have to reevaluate where we're at. We're seeing weather patterns, water flows, erratic heat and cold. We have time to prevent the worst impacts of climate change that requires us to cut our emissions by quite a margin as soon as possible. We can do this and do this well if we do it with planning, caring, and grit. We'll have a better time of doing this if we're the forerunners, showing the way forward. It's hard to take a pagan seriously that says, I worship the earth, but then does literally nothing to change the material circumstances that are actively heating up the planet. What this doesn't mean is that we should be walking around whipping ourselves as though castigating ourselves is going to fix the problem either. Okay, we're talking to each other over the internet, which uses an incredible amount of CO2, energy, resources, etc. We live in the world we live in. If indeed we hold the earth as sacred, our gods and goddesses of this world as sacred, and we wish for tomorrow to be better for our descendants, we need to act. We need to put aside guilt. Guilt is a stopping measure. It is not a place to stay. Guilt tells us that something needs addressing. If that's the place where we stop and we just wallow in it, we are losing the opportunity to address the imbalance. So let's move on. Peak oil, climate change in the economy. You can't disentangle the climate, oil, and financial systems here. We operate under a fiat financial currency system that we print money by borrowing it into existence. The money has value because we say it does. Fiat basically means because it is so. What this does is that even if you were to untangle all financial threads, wind the debt back to zero, the entire economy literally goes away. The financial system must always expand because without endless growth, future prosperity within our economy is not possible. The problem with running our economy in this fashion is that it punishes savings and conservation methods because for instance, it was recently put out on NPR that the plastics companies absolutely knew that recycling was bull, okay? They recycle maybe 10% of the total plastics produced, maybe. Now, why would they sell recycling to us as a concept if they knew that so little of it would be possible, if not profitable, because that way they could produce more plastic and we'd ignore the problem. Long story short, we have to disentangle the financial incentives that allow the economy to function the way it does. And this isn't capitalist, it's not anti-capitalist, it's just reality. Whatever your economic philosophy is, we cannot continue to operate the way we are. Without the financial system demanding endless growth, you would not have the kinds of demands put on the environment. Drilling for oil to make plastics, we buy for everything from car parts to saran wrap because there's no enough in this economy. Because between planned obsolescence and the very way the market functions, there's no enough. You have to keep producing in order to keep the profits rolling in, in order to keep the economic engine turning. Without oil, the machines that extract all the other fossil fuels we burn, including forms of oil itself, can't operate. Without cheap and abundant energy fuels, our modern economy goes away, and so does the way we live. According to PicoBarrow.com, we consume around four times as much oil as we discover. Our economy and the use of non-renewable energy resources is unsustainable, completely unsustainable. If we acknowledge that our resources use and our economy is unsustainable, we don't face a problem, we face a predicament. John L. Michael Greer's definition here is excellent. A problem calls for a solution. The only question is whether one can be found, made to work, and once this is done, the problem is solved. A predicament, by contrast, has no solution. Faced with a predicament, people come up with responses. Those responses may succeed, they may fail, or they may fall somewhere in between, but none of them solves it in the sense that none of them make it go away. You do not make climate change go away. You don't make peak oil go away. At this point, our job is to mitigate the worst of both situations. So how do we address these predicaments? I'll tell you what we don't do. 
We don't go to utopianism and we don't do apocalyptic stories. They're both useless. These are stock responses that people have when looking at peak oil and climate change. One's the notion that somehow a nebulous they is going to fix this thing, whether it's ascended masters or the latest tech wizards. Another is that we're all doomed. All right, look, Jeff Bezos could solve this thing in his sleep if he wanted, taking maybe 20% of his total market value, throw it at the problem, and in 20 years make much more money based just if we never address the underlying economic issues. He could literally toss most of his largesse at the problem and sleep soundly. He's not going to fix this. Elon Musk is not going to fix this. Utopian and apocalyptic narratives hinder any kind of useful progress because it allows us to set aside our responsibility to do everything we can do to address our predicaments. They're cop-outs. We can partner with the gods, ancestors, and spirits to face the challenges ahead of us, but they're not here to take the work off our shoulders. Now, this is not to say that the hundred companies producing the most carbon in this world don't need to be stopped from doing it. They do. But that does not abdicate my responsibility to burn less oil, to do less. Now, a lot of us are actually burning a lot less oil because, well, COVID <laughs> being what it is, we're isolating in place, a lot of us. And if you're not isolating in place, at least you're probably burning a lot less fuel and going a lot less places than you used to. So we're going to see at least a bump here, but it's also being taken up on the other side by more Amazon and uh, USPS and, well, hopefully more USPS because God knows they need the money. Uh, more orders of packages and more carry out, more takeout. So the thing we need to really be paying attention to is our carbon footprint and the carbon footprint of the resources and things that we directly hook into. Every time we've been promised a new wonder technology that's gonna lift us out of drudge, what that's meant is that technology is gonna be more cumbersome or some poor person in another country is gonna be manufacturing it just to cover the cost of components and inhumane working conditions to produce the components and technology the end user gets. Any of us who carries a cell phone or what have you is complicit. That's not to shame. I have a cell phone. I intend to use it till this thing drops dead. This is probably my last new cell phone. Why? Because the ability to recycle the component pieces of our technology is overhyped and it's far better to prevent the extraction of more resources than to contribute to the problem. Moving forward, this is quite literally interwoven in the fabric of the clothing we wear. The techno utopian they'll find solution things ignores the downside of the environment when it's tech fixes. The they'll fix it encourages passivity in action and an inherently destructive system that's one major crisis away from coming apart. The just-in-time delivery system is a pure great example of this. Amazon can get you that part you need tomorrow as long as it has in stock, has cheap abundant energy, and enough people paying in Prime memberships with government kickbacks to provide that part at the cheap, cheapest price so they make the most profit from the sale. That falls apart if that chain of logistics gets interrupted. The importance of inspirations in our stories in addressing peak oil and climate change can't be overstated. What empowers us is important. As polytheists, our cosmologies are alive with gods, ancestors, spirits, all their myths and stories. And rather than giving into the delusion of utopia dreams or apocalypse, inspiration can come from our relationships with the gods, ancestors, spirits, their myths and stories. And it can come directly from our relationships with them. Our gods overcome immense odds and not always through sheer strength. It helps us to take a closer look at all our myths and not merely rely on the interpretation of academics. Really dig into the myths and think about what they mean for us. Like Ragnarok's a great example. It's not just an ending, it's also a beginning. What precipitates Ragnarok? What does Fenris Ulfur represent? What does he do when he's loosed? How is he bound? What does it say that Odin orders Fenris to be bound and is eaten later by the wolf? We can take inspiration to do things different. We can take inspiration from the example of Ragnarok that even in the place the face of the blazing flame that Surt unleashes, there is yet life left in Yggdrasil. Perhaps the biggest testament to our ancestors is we live. Despite all the predicaments our ancestors faced, wherever they were, we live. We live in relationship with our gods, ancestors, and spirits. We live on the land and in concert with the land spirits. How can we live better with them? How can we live with less and live better together with the holy powers, both personally and community? How can we live with less energy, stuff, and stimulation? So, addressing the predicaments. When the United States was first founded, almost every citizen, including the founding fathers, engaged in some kind of farming. The majority of American citizens, 70 to 80%, 
Last I read, they live in cities. It doesn't mean we need to decant the cities into rural areas. Some folks will want to go to rural living. That's a fine thing. But for those of you thinking about going to the land, do so now so you can make your failures while you have the time to do it without the threat of starvation. We need to provide more opportunities for our cities and the surrounding areas to provide their own decentralized means of self-support, including food, fuel, water, and waste care. The way that we do things now, half the time we are woefully behind. We are woefully behind our infrastructure investment. We are woefully behind in our investment in restorative methods of agriculture, fuel use, water, and the care of our waste. So we, in living within an economy that's unraveling means our interdependent relationships in our own communities are going to matter more and more, far more than the average American can really appreciate right now. How many people here know a farmer, a butcher, a beekeeper, a brewer, a carpenter? You know, these are things that require hands-on skills to do well. And even these are done right now with extensive reliance on fossil fuels. How will these change? How can we begin the process of decoupling now? You might be that person that people get to know who organizes the community garden or the community compost, the person who runs for city council or mayor to change the, to, to engage the changes that have to be made. Perhaps you're the person that's going to farm a garden. Perhaps you're going to be a butcher or a brewer. Perhaps you'll do all these things or other things or none of these things. A lot of families did their own homestead crafts, including everything from growing crops, raising livestock, constructing beehives, making candles from fat from animals and beeswax, to brewing their own beer, from making cloth to making their own homes from materials around them. And we're certainly not going to go back to colonial times where everybody's going to have a log cabin, but it's, it's useful to think of how our ancestors lived so we can better live in concert with nature around us, avoid the mistakes our ancestors made in not doing that either, and live better. Um, living with less is less energy stuff and stimulation. If we hope to adapt the oncoming predicaments, we need to, using his phrase, collapse now and avoid the rush. Another word that I first heard through him was disintermediation. This is simplifying your life's processes as much as we can from where we grow our food, how we make our homes, decentralizing good growth and distribution, power generation, organization of our communities, how we dispose of our waste, so on and so on. The more that we can do on a local level, the better off we are because we're not dependent on long forms of logistics that rely on cheap, abundant fossil fuels. This addresses the problems of PICO and climate change together instead of apart. So we can do things like learn a craft, reskill, go back to the land if that's where you're feeling called to, uh, engage in right to repair. One of the biggest obstacles in facing planned obsolescence and all the carbon that comes out of our consumer lifestyle is that we can't, we, we can't repair, you know, uh, uh, it should not take a gargantuan effort to jailbreak an Apple phone so that you can fix the screen or that you can fix something that goes wrong in one of the components. Um, something that I got turned on to again by JMG, John Michael Greer was the appropriate tech movement. And this is appropriate tech was, um, basically one of the early pioneers of solar and wind in use for home. They're a great resource to look at. There's a lot that's been uh, developed since. The green wizardry groups that um, JMG and uh, his cohorts have founded since are kind of the modern reflection of this. Uh, get into DIY, do as much as you can. Trial and error is not something to be afraid of. Um, you know, I, to put it this way, I blew up my first keg of mead because I made a mistake. Now, gratefully, I wrapped that keg in a blanket, and so I didn't have glass shards everywhere. But mistakes happen. I learned from that mistake, and I became a better home brewer for it. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to waste resources, but by passing on expertise to the next generation, that is going to save us all a lot of time and resources. You don't have to go shop at, you know, your, your big, big beer distributors. I mean, we're spoiled for choice here as far as craft brewing goes in, in Michigan. So do DIY, whether it's repairing a faucet or what have you. I mean, if, if you need a, if you need an expert, like just be, be real and get an expert, but within your own capacity to do things, do things. 
Um, engage in community action projects. You know, I'm not a plumber. I need to call a plumber in if something is beyond my ken to deal with. You know, if if I need something for my water source related needs to be rerouted or it's flooding or whatever, I'm not the guy to do it. But that means I reach out to my community and I say, hey, I need this thing done. And we're still at the point where there's enough plumbers around that it's not going to break the bank for me to bring one in. So community action projects start now. Collapse now and avoid the rush. Start with hobbies, crochet, knit, garden, leatherwork, brew. Find a hobby, embrace it. Um, if you find a hobby that hooks into your hobby, like the primary source of ingredients for your hobby, like if you like to weave but you can't raise sheep, invest in a local herder. Right now, wool is cheap. There's a huge lack of investment in it. If you want to cook but you can't raise all or most of your crops, invest in a CSA, invest in your local farmer. <clears throat> so grow food that you're going to eat, herbs you're going to cook with. And you can do this whether you're in a high rise or you're in, you know, uh, huge tracts of land all around you. You can grow food you're going to eat and herbs you cook with. Can, make jams, jellies with the things you eat. Um, keep in mind that a lot of produce that's ugly food it gets turned into stuff like salsa. It doesn't have to be pretty to be useful. Get used to eating as much as you can in season now. Far better with most of this stuff to collapse down and avoid the rush. Canning while you have the technology to do so is key because you can build resilience this way. In point of fact, I think in future, uh, I think in future iterations of this, I'm going to put a definition for resilience in there because resilience is huge. Resilience is the ability for a community or a person to bounce back from adverse conditions. It's the ability to weather crises and shocks. So again, another way to address the predicament is garden. Any size garden's gonna make a difference. There have been abandoned car lots that can grow sweet potatoes and other foods in abundance. All that's needed was a few feet of organic soil, a bit of hay and regular watering. The Chicago Honey Co-op is in the inner city of Chicago and produces beautiful honey while having pavement gardens like those I just described. MidwestPermaculture.com's Intro to Permaculture series goes over this in great detail. Great series. Highly recommend it. So how do we also address this from the spiritual angle? Worship and offerings, invitation to relationships. The work and the results of that work can be worship and offerings in and of themselves. So if you worship, say, Frigg, your weaving and your support of local sheep herders or what have you is potentially an offering to her if you make it one. Likewise, if you want to learn how to cook, maybe you'll make an offering to, oh, say, Vesta or one of your household gods, or maybe to the spirit of the house itself in, when you do upkeep. Nope. What matters is the mindset that we move forward with. Climate change and peak oil are coming whether we want them to or not. The best we can do is to approach our lives mindfully, carefully, living as much as we can with less energy stuff and stimulation so that our lives live in accordance with our, are lived in accordance with our values. We can do spirit work and magic. We can partner with our gods, ancestors, and spirits in our work. Any craft is ripe for this, like when I brew. Um, I'm not just engaging in uh, a craft hobby I like. I'm also engaging with the gods of brewing, with Odin and Gunlad, with Freya, with the bees as uh, physical beings. I make offerings to the beeveteer. I support local beekeepers when and where I can. And the ingredients that I purchase are supported through local uh, shops when I can afford to, or when I can go and uh, order online from them. Uh, Homebrewing.com, uh, I believe, is one of the ones that I work with. Adventures in Home Brewing is a local brew store to me. And they're one of the people that I support with my purchases. And so any, cr any craft, any pursuit in this addressing of climate change and peak oil is one step in the right direction, is one step forward. So 
the long, the, what I really want to take away from this is that we're coming into better alignment with our values and our actions. We're coming into better alignment with our relationships with the holy powers, and we're coming into better alignment with our communities and building our future. So where are some sources that we can learn about this stuff? I highly recommend John Michael Greer, Green, Green, Green Wizardry, uh, Green Wizardry, The Long Descent, among others. His blog is ecosophia.net. There's Chris Martinson and Peak Prosperity. The Crash Course was a really good resource that I ran into very early on in trying to wrap my head around all of this. The Post Carbon Institute with lectures by Richard Heinberg and other members at resilience.org. Uh, there's the Crossroads, the Crossing Hedgerow Sanctuary that I am a member of, a co-founder of the foundation for. And there's also Living Roots Creations. Check out her Patreon and her Witchy Weed Wednesdays. She talks about and works with the spirits of local plants. So definitely check her work out. Uh, Crossing Hedgerow Sanctuary is local. It is a pagan sanctuary, 501c3. And we are an ongoing effort to bring pagans of all stripes and anybody else who really wants to come and reconnect with nature in a permaculture space, a permaculture farm space. Uh, we got a bunch of projects in the works right now that we are hoping will bring the pagan community together to work with and on the land. And again, check out Living Roots Creations. Check out our Patreon, Witchy Weed Wednesdays. Deanne Bednar and the folks at Straw Bale Studio in Oxford, Michigan. These folks are amazing. Their workshops are definitely worth taking. There's the Einwright Ridge Urban Eco Village in Price Hill, Cincinnati, Ohio. The Carbon Free Home by Stephen and Rebecca Hren. I definitely recommend you look that up. Then there's also the Chicago Honey Co-op that I uh, talked about earlier. You can also email me at sarth at gmail.com. So at this point, we're going to open up the floor for discussion. I am going to kill the screen share. And I'm going to pull up my little thing here. There we go. So, all right. Can you pass host back to me while we're waiting for questions? Um, what? <laughs> can, you, can you pass host back to me? So, I can oh. be able to play the drums while we're, we're finishing up. So oh, right. I can't do it. I can't speak here. Yeah. yeah, I can uh, pass those resources to you right quick. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Whoops. Huh. I probably want that in text form. Oh God, it, it is not, it is not formatting correctly. <laughs> That's not I muted well. myself there. No, I was asking you to make me the Zoom host again. Oh, right. Duh. Okay. You can, you can send me the other stuff later. Right. Okay. Hang on. Make host. There we go. Yes. I want to change the host. There we go. It's the host right. with the most. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh. So while I'm waiting for questions, do you have any? Any thoughts, questions? Were you asking me personally or? Yeah, you, folks in the. Uh, didn't have anything I, I was, one thing I found interesting about studying ancient cultures is the extent to which they did sacred work and sacred song while doing crafting. So I'd love to see us go back to doing a little more of that in the pagan context of the actual work songs for even housework. Yeah, I mean, um, I I would love to see more of that kind of down home singing come back. Uh, ooh, okay, here we go. Here's a question. I'd love to hear more about what Crossing Hedgerows is doing locally. If no one has discussion stuff, so most of our work right now is based around getting the sanctuary up and running. So in the future, some of our build projects are making a, a Celtic roundhouse. So right now what we're doing is we had to clear the land in order to make our construction projects work. So there are sections of the land that we had to clear. Now the process that we did for doing that was we went to the spirits, made our offerings, said, is this something that you're willing to allow us to do? They said, yes, we understand what you're doing. And so, we're going to be building a uh, Celtic roundhouse for meetings. And part of the work of the sanctuary itself is that it's a permaculture farm. So we have uh, 
chickens integrated into, excuse me, the uh, very the hoop house and various points in the farm production. So, for instance, last week I was uh, cleaning out the chicken coop, and what the chicken coop does is we provide grains, but also greens for the chickens to eat that we can't eat, which is a time-honored practice because that's one of the things of raising animals for meat is they can eat the stuff that we humans can't. And they're a way of biomass to accumulate and to produce things such as eggs, cheese, you know, uh, milk, of course, which we've turned to various products from cheese, yogurt, um, so on and so forth. The thing that we do with the chickens is the clearing out of the chicken coop allows us to make compost and that compost is potent stuff because once it breaks down, we then take that and we've made, uh, I think this year we made 17 or 18 garden beds using just uh, the compost from the chicken beds and from broken down uh, wood waste from projects in the area. The reason that we're doing so much land clearing right now is to provide infrastructure for water drainage so that we're not flooding every time the, the Swan Creek floods and so that we can have places to put on workshops, seminars, and meetings. So what are we doing locally? Right now for the paying community, not a whole lot because we're still in the, the pre-work stages of, well, it's not even pre-work at this point, it's just work stages for putting infrastructure in place so that we can actually do things. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really proud of the work we've done. We've been around for two years. And in that time, we went from, well, this is a really cool idea. How are we going to do this to, oh, my God, we're building stuff. <laughs> I think we're also one of the only places I've seen in the Midwest area. Yes, it is Swan Creek in the Belleville area. Uh, go to crossinghedrows.com. And I'll put that link in the uh, chat description. Yeah, I, I grew up there near, near there too. Um, and you can see um, on our website, the latest news and photos, our mission statement, how to donate, how to stay in touch, our calendar, who the board members are and group rental information if you wanna come out and rent the place. And we have a uh, we've just updated our blog relatively recently so i definitely recommend folks check us out um, come on enjoy the sanctuary just give us a heads up because we are still uh, socially distancing and we'll be more than happy to provide time and place for you folks to come and check things out so uh l skinner says how do we emotionally disconnect from the promises of oh <laughs> Oh, this is a good one. How do we emotionally disconnect from the promises of scientific utopia and apocalypse we've been sold? Ooh. I think I need more than water. Okay. The first thing to do is recognize these are binary false choices. There is no techno utopia coming. There is no apocalypse coming. Things are going to get really, really hard if we don't do something. We can mitigate that hardness, but we can't stop climate change. We're beyond the point of no return. Climate change is baked into the cake at this point. How do we emotionally disconnect from the promises of it? We literally tell ourselves this future is not possible because it's not. Yeah, yeah. Cyber. Oh, that's a really good point. Thank you. Warrior of the Wolf notes cyberpunk versus solarpunk. And I think earlier in the chat, Warrior of the Wolf was, uh, I'm pretty sure I know who this is, uh, was uh, talking about solarpunk. And I think solarpunk is a wonderful development. Now, don't get me wrong. I like my cyberpunk. I like my Blade Runner and I like my Shadowrun. But I also understand that ideologically it has limits because the paradigm that Shadowrun is swimming in is late stage capitalism. And we need to move beyond capitalism and reactionary politics to a point where we are engaging in hopeful work. Because the thing about promises of scientific utopianism and apocalypse is they take hope out of our hands. 
scientific utopianism abdicates responsibility because it puts hands in the hand, it, it, put, it hands the power of hope and change and gives it to somebody else in the hopes that they're going to fix the problem. Well, the, the problem can't be fixed for one. For two, you can't money your way out of this because the very root of how we do money is part of the problem there's this sense of yeah i'm right there with you where where's my magic well you know uh, we're still working on the, the fifth world it's okay it's it's coming um <laughs> scientific I, I pick on scientific utopianism a lot because it is the predominant narrative in a lot of this the circles i travel in whereas apocalypse isn't apocalypse tends to be on the other side of this the uh, apocalypse narrative of we're doomed, we're doomed. Nothing we can do is going to fix this. We're all doomed. Well, that doesn't help anybody. That's literally just throwing in the towel before you've even hit the first round. So the the problem with apocalypse narratives is the exact same problem with utopian narratives. They're two sides of the same coin. Both of them take your power to do anything put it in somebody else's hands and say, it's all good God or the ascendant masters or the, you know, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk types are going to fix this. Um, and it's just not going to happen. These guys have a vested interest in not fixing the problem. So we need to, as citizens of the world, as individuals, we don't need to follow the same narrative. Um, we may find that disunity in this case, decentralization, following different paths, even if we have the same kind of ideas in mind, are going to be much more useful to us than trying to go one way. In part because trying a Texas solution in Michigan may not work. And that's not because you know Texans are stupid and Michiganders are smart or vice versa. It's because we're in indifferent environments. We're in, we're in the Great Lakes and they're not. So our solutions need to be geared toward our environment. If there are problems that we're going to address with the local landscape, such as dam removal, those are problems we can fix, by the way. We can't fix the overall, the overall predicament of climate change or peak oil, but there are things that we can fix to make it easier. So putting our eggs in the basket of scientific utopianism and apocalypse takes our ability to problem solve what things are within our grasp to solve and then take our responsibility and tosses it out of our hands into somebody else's lap and says, here you go. And that is simultaneously really gross because it abdicates our responsibility, but then it puts them on a pedestal even more so than they already are by the way the system functions to please save me from myself. So this is a, this is a problem. And as polytheists, I think that we owe our ourselves, if not our gods, ancestors, and spirits, a better way forward than I'm going to trust in Elon Musk. Sorry, as Spider Biker pointed out, Elon literally wants to run away to Mars. What I recommend is practices without those towards medieval crafts. I, so... I mean, my, my heart does have a sp soft spot for medieval crafts. I think anything that supports lower impact on the environment is great. And that can be buying lo local food, gardening. It can be, uh, I grow one plant in a pot. That's one less plant that I purchase from somebody else. That's one less plant that somebody who is being taken advantage of in a rotten worker situation you know it's not just one aspect of you know environmental justice or addressing peak oil or addressing climate change these things are intertwined so starting off you know the root of polytheism is in good relationship with our gods ancestors and spirits so if nothing else do good cultists 
make offerings of food you've grown yourself or that you've supported through uh, CSAs or your local farmer. Uh, if there's a fish market near you, support your local fishermen. So with the offerings we give, we can support the local environment in a positive way. And we can be the positive feedback loops that produce the changes that we want to see in the world and that produce good relationships with ourselves and our neighbors, ourselves and our gods, ourselves and our ancestors, ourselves and our spirits. Anything that we can do to lighten our load on the earth, carbon load, resource load, whatever you want to take that to, you don't even have to like do, say, null binding or weaving or whatever to get this benefit. You can support the people who don't who do these things oh that's a really good point the better you get at fiber crafts the more you can do them as a multitasking activity for prone to needing to be busy it's great for grounding because it's repetitive and bonus warm socks yes that so my wife is a crocheter and will very frequently uh go into crochet mode when she needs to keep her hands busy whether say we're on a car trip or we're just hanging out and she produces some really cool bags as a result. Um, she made a poker ball for our daughter. And so <laughs> you know, there's all kinds of things that you can do, whether you're craft inclined or not. You can do all kinds of things to support local businesses. Now, let's say you don't, you know, you don't have any interest in um, say handicrafts like woodworking, leatherworking or whatever cool there's other stuff that you can do uh you can organize online petition drives for saving this or that environment you can organize your local communities to do work days at your say crossing hedgerow sanctuary at your <laughs> at your local permaculture group you can encourage uh on the local level, you can get involved in politics so that the zoning boards are much more amenable to all natural building methods. There's always something you can do, and it doesn't have to be building something or making something. And you, you can apply all of your worldview in this pursuit because we don't have to live separate lives. We can live integrated, whole healthier lives by bringing our religion and our culture. And I really think that we need to be moving polytheism more toward culture because it's not just these are the gods and ancestors and spirits I worship. What we're really talking about, fundamentally speaking, is a way of living, a, a living worldview. So it isn't just on building stuff. It isn't just on, I'm going to make this thing. It's community and how we live it's how we develop interrelated communal networks of mutual beneficence it is being the positive feedback loop oh you're you're welcome um yeah crossing hedgerows is i yes i am biased and i am a founding member of it but it's also what i was looking to do uh, to address peak oil and climate change. And I'm sure for those of our listeners who aren't near the Ipsy Arbor Belleville area, there are unique and powerful people doing this work too. Look up your local transition town movements. Look up your local... Oh, damn, that's one thing I really wish I'd remember to put in my notes. Transition town, um, permaculture groups, permaculture design groups... If you're not in the Michigan area, I don't know what to tell you because this is mainly where I'm based. But for those who are watching this online, talk with your local people. You know, if there's no transition town in your area, maybe think about starting one. Um, look at the transition town uh, handbook. Uh, engage in exchange with folks who are interested in the same stuff you are. Community building is huge because at the end of the day, what we're talking about fundamentally is going to uproot and re 
reorient our entire world. Peak oil and climate change are going to take the long chain complex logistics systems and upend them. We need to be preparing for that. Not because we're worried about some doom and gloom Mad Max scenario. It's a question of logistics in terms of food distribution. It's not that we don't make enough food for everybody. It's distribution. This is why food deserts ex exist. This is the integration of restorative justice into how we produce and distribute and do food. This is how we integrate re restorative justice into the products we make. This is how we integrate black, Latino, indigenous ways of understanding the world and all these communities. There is so much potential for restorative justice in reorienting ourselves on the local level in no small part because we have to reintegrate our fractured atomized lives into the places we're living again and look at them as living connections with our neighbors. And that can be pretty damn intimidating when for the last 20, 30 years, we have existed as an atomized individualistic culture. And now we're looking at a legit way more collectivist future if we're going to be able to effectively move to address these predicaments. So this isn't just the pagan community needing to talk to itself or the polytheist community is needing to talk to itself, although that does really need to happen down these lines. It's also talking with our Christian and Muslim and other neighbors. This is talking with our Jewish neighbors. This is talking with our Baha'i neighbors. This is talking with our Sikh neighbors. This is living in this world as interconnected people. And that can be quite intimidating. And I don't expect people to get over that intimidation in a day, but it's something worth considering that if you actually had to live on the local level without the intermediation of Amazon and Facebook and everything else, how would you live your life? So this is also about decoupling your life from mass communication and actually getting to know your neighbors. This might be getting to know the people if you're living in an apartment and this can be intimidating, but this can be getting to know your apartment neighbors. You know, this is going to be checking up on each other in a much more intimate way than many people are used to. Um, <clears throat> so this is integrating your magic into things that empower you, your community, and bring beauty in a continuous way to the world. This is putting an offering down that can biodegrade, that isn't going to harm. This is being mindful of what you buy, how you buy it, where it goes, what it does. So this is integrating your life with the fullness of polytheism in looking at it in terms of how do we address these predicaments? How do we relate to one another? And how do we decouple ourselves from the massive sprawling infrastructure, which is ready to crumble once this really gets going? This is integrating polytheism to every corner of your life, really. So addressing peak oil and climate change is living more mindfully, more fully within the polytheist mindset. Addressing peak oil and climate change is the application of polytheism's worldview to how we live in and on and with our gods of the earth, our landvatir, our ancestors, our gods in general. So this is looking at how are we to live? And everybody's going to have different answers. And some of them might butt heads against each other. And that's okay. You do not have to agree with me for your method of addressing to be useful and valuable. So I heavily recommend that folks take a really good look at permaculture, at regenerative and restorative agriculture, at silvopasturing. So there's an entire plethora of things that you can look at. 
but I would start with permaculture, regenerative agriculture, um, and regenerative farming techniques. And some of these are going to involve how we uh, live on the land and how we get our food. And these are going to, you know, these are affecting our everyday life choices. So this is not anything to, to really like take on willy nilly. And it's also not anything to take on with deep fear. This is how we relate to the world, folks. Just sit down, think about it, talk it out with your friends, talk it out with your community members. And, and Rob makes a really good point. Disagreeing is an important part of polytheism. Yes, absolutely. And not having to arrive at the same conclusion, even if we agree that this is the predicament and this is what needs to happen in terms of we need to address this problem, we can disagree with the particulars on how we do that. So I won't give you any across the board, this is how we solve this. There is no solving it. And there is no universal addressing of this issue either. This is something for every community to come together and say, well, this is the situation. We accept that these are the facts in the ground. Now, how do we move forward? So um, if folks don't have any other questions, I think that is the end. I'll give people a few uh, seconds in case there are any last minute questions. Yep. Thank you very much for presenting this. I had a lot of people telling me that this was the thing they were going to come to see, or this was the thing they were going to watch on the video later. Oh, cool. Oh, I'm so now, happy no to hear that. No to the other two workshops, but this is the one that really got most people's attention. Very cool. I'm, I'm happy because I wasn't sure when I offered it if the, if the interest would be that high. I think so. Very cool. We actually, we had topped out at 13 people watching at once during your thing. Sweet. Not surprise me. Of course, with only 13 viewers, maybe we should have done the whole thing as a Zoom session, but eh, it's all assuming good. that I got it right, assuming that I got the YouTube settings right and this thing automatically recorded and will be on YouTube, then that will be a good thing, I think. Oh, wait. What's up, Shan? Um, I don't know. We don't have one yet. TM. We do not yet have a blacksmith, but uh, I'm sure we could be open to it. <clears throat> That's the thing is that we're we're constantly looking for folks who have ideas and who want to do things. So I'd be down for a blacksmith, especially because maybe down down the road we might want to have maybe livestock. That would be really cool, and. If nothing else, a an on-site fair would be amazing. Um, so at my farm, I, I would like a blacksmith workshop. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, the the uh, long story short is that we're really open to a lot of ideas and a lot of ways of uh, addressing the predicament, and if if folks want to contribute in different ways, we're, we're rather open to that. So if you've got an idea or something that you want to explore, bring it on, bring it on, let us know about it and we'll see. Are there any other questions? Last chance. If not, I'm going to hit the big red button shortly that says end stream on it. Oh, give them one minute and then we'll see if uh, anybody's got a question or anything like that. Um, again, if you want to hit me up, uh, my email is s-a-r-e-n-t-h at gmail.com. Uh, for the Crossing Hedgerows Sanctuary information, go to crossinghedgerows.com. C-R-O-S-S-I-N-G-H-E-G-E-R-O-W-S.com. Uh, if you have questions, if you have comments, please, please, please send me emails. Uh, talk to the folks at Crossing Hedgerows. Uh, talk to your local permaculture and transition town and all these local efforts that are in your area. CSAs, do your work and good luck and blessings to you all. And I think we're going to call it there because it's been five minutes after four. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, it's funny how many people assume that the whole, I set up the stream from one to four, it is going to start at one, whether we're ready or not, it's going to end at four, whether we're ready or not. Like, you know, the, the, there are big buttons on the YouTube screen here that I have to hit <laughs> before anything happens. I promise you, because I could have accidentally hit it two hours ago, and that would have been fun to try to recover from. Right. Okay. So go ahead. Um, let's see. Well, I'm really happy that folks uh, enjoyed this. I'm really happy that folks showed up for it. Um, Warrior of the Wolf makes a good point. Not a question. Look up your local plants and trees and plant more of those. Yes. Look up the flowers your pollinators like. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And your pollinators are not just bees. Your pollinators include a lot of animals and plants you may not like. So this is also your challenge to get over prejudice regarding animals and insects that you may find labeled under the term of pest and that you need to reevaluate your relationship with them because they might be indigenous to the area and you're going to need to, they might be native to the area and you're going to need to really reevaluate your placement and things. Um, Spider Biker, thank you. I'm so happy you were able to come. And yeah, it is a lot to digest. And again, if, if folks need any more info, hit me up or hit up Crossing Hedgerows. Yes, wasps are a great example of pollinators that you're going to probably have to work with. Um, when we were recently uh, harvesting, we had to, con not contend, we had to provide space between ourselves and the, the wasps because they were eating too. So, yes, Living Roots Creations, I think I plugged them earlier, and she's amazing. And Living Roots Creations um, is on Patreon. I definitely recommend you check her out and check her work out. So... Um, they have a Facebook account too. I follow that one. Yes, yes. Follow, like, subscribe to the Patreon. Um, and definitely keep checking out the Ann Arbor uh, Pagan Pride space because hopefully next year we're going to be able to do this physically. And it'd be really cool if we could do simulcasts. That'd be interesting to try. Yeah. What might be our biggest challenge other than health situations is mm. that the only date we could get was the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So... I hope it doesn't get us off to a somber start to the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Everyone reading their news feeds in the morning about uh, all the death and destruction. Mm -hmm. But it's, it just gives us more of a challenge to overcome that. Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, if I did this correctly, this video will be available on YouTube indefinitely. If not, then consider yourselves an exclusive group who got to see this thing that will accidentally be deleted. Um, <laughs> put the video on, so I had to go to the trouble of moving my entire computer set up here so I could get better lighting, so I should put my face on here a little tiny bit. Uh, I am the Reverend Rob Henderson. Um, you can follow Ann Arbor Pagan Pride on Facebook or our website, annarborpaganpride.org. We don't do a lot of events, but we will, um, we are aiming to do our face-to-face -face event again September 11th, 2021. And we will probably have a fundraiser at some point during the year in order to pay for that. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, I hope to see you all in person at some point soon. And if I did this correctly, I can... Uh, you play, okay. Oh, I'll send you off with some music. If I can get it working. If not, it won't be too embarrassing. Okay, take care, everyone.